It's June 6th, 2022. This is Rook. Welcome to episode 183 of Rook. Wow. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Hope you're keeping well wherever you're tuning in from around the world. Hello to you from Toronto, Canada. Salam Dustan Aziz. Durud Bar Shoma. Hello to the fabulous team assembled today. Hello, Guru Hi, Hi, Captain Reza. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Hello to the fabulous Keon. Hi, Gian. You were um, astounded that it's uh, episode 183. I was. Yeah. I was shocked. You right do that now. every week. Last week was 182. Really? Yeah. I keep thinking it's 170 still. Hmm. He's know. shocked when he can do math. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Pride Month. Happy Pride Month, oh. everybody. Shout out to the members of the uh, LGBTQ community within the Iranian community and beyond. We put up a fun Rook video moment with Cave on Zand yesterday. Mm. Check it out on Instagram. Uh, and a shout out to uh, Pride Month and Happy Pride, everybody. Awesome. Quite a show we have today. So uh, first up, Nikki Nakavi. Nikki Nakavi is a, a young Iranian-American violinist who is, first of all, she's super talented. She grew she was born in Texas, grew up in, mm-hmm. she's an American kid, yeah. uh, but of Iranian extraction, so much so that she speaks Persian really well and can actually play Persian songs on the oh, violin. How old is uh, she? She's 21, yeah, I think. Oh, she's yeah. young. Yes. You interested? <laughs> no, thank you very much. And I'm motahil almost. Um, <laughs> what does motahil mean? Yes, I'm, I got, I'm take in it. a relationship. Yeah, I see. Take All right. Yeah. That'll be a relief to a lot of people listening. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a lot of fans today, man. I'm not, you're not giving it to me, Gomeshi. You're not giving me love today. <laughs> Reza, I always give you love. You're my main man. Uh, of course. Um, no, Nikki is a really, so she's a really talented violinist who started playing when she was four years old and um, is now working as she's actually done work with the Boston Philharmonic. She's played Carnegie Hall. She's 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 impressive, but also um, she's chosen to give back. She started this program called Through the Staff, which um, helps uh, young people learn to play instruments, uh, those who don't have the means to pay for lessons and stuff. She she started this group that offers free lessons for them. And she's become quite well known on social media because she does these videos of her playing the violin, but she covers famous songs mm-hmm. and does like a, you know, she'll take like a pop hit and do it on the violin. Uh, and it's really fun to watch. So Nikki Nagavi coming up from Dallas. Uh, in a few uh, moments. And then Golshid Mola. 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 Golshid Golshid Mola. Mola. The last name is M O L A. Yes, not Mola. Now, I don't yeah. want to be saying Mola. Oh, boy, you don't. Yeah, I yes. just have to practice how to say Mola. <laughs> you know when, when you put, you know what Tashtid is, Gian? Um, tashtid. Yeah, I put a little bit of that on my Hormasab. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's, I, uh, that's I have Asha, Asha Tashtid sometimes. Uh, Asha Kash. Yeah. No, that's Kash you're talking yes, about. That not is Kash, yes. And they put it on Ash, which is which will taste yes. fantastic. What is Tashtid? Tashtid is when you're tra- when you want to um, um, when you have to like pronounce the word Mola when uh-huh. they like the letter is. By Tashtid Bukhana. Tashtid Bukhana. You mean is that the flair, the accent you put on it? I have to use the right Tashtid. Yeah, yeah. Well, the thing is, is that if I say it in English, yeah. Golshid Mola, yeah. that that's correct, but it doesn't sound very good. I, it doesn't sound you. Persian. So if I want to say Golshid, <laughs> I feel like I have to say yeah. Golshid Mola, but that's not right. <laughs> that's not right. That it, it conjures up all kinds of images of Ayatollahs, <laughs> which pro- poor Golshid probably doesn't really <laughs> no, do no, it. No, 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 yeah. no. We don't want to do that. So no, how no. do you say it? For I'd me now? say, uh, how about this? Imagine it. It's if 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 it was spelled M O E L A. How would you say that? I or would say M-O-W. I would say, yeah. Or M-O- oh, Mola. 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 Yeah. Golshin Mola. Mola. There we go. Still sounds really like I'm real Canadian saying that. Just say Golshin, Yo, Golshin, Golshin Mola. Golshin M yeah. in the house. Anyway, Golshin <laughs> is an entrepreneur and creative who founded Alangu. 
you guys have heard of Alan Gu, yes, obviously, yes, and I, yes. folk, I think a lot of folks who are listening will have. So Alan Gu is this global, it's a platform, it's an exchange marketplace that mm-hmm. um, uh, designers sell wearable art, lifestyle pieces, and more at. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they, with a real focus on independent artists and designers from Iran and the Middle East. This was, she was one of the pioneers of doing this a few years ago when she launched Alangu. So we'll talk to her about starting Alangu, this this um, digital marketplace, this exchange platform. Uh, but also, she's got uh, a big fashion show coming up at the end of the week, an Alangu fashion show. I think it's the first of its kind featuring Iranian designers, Middle Eastern designers in Los Angeles. Mm. So if you're in LA, we are going to give you a promo code oh, nice. for for so that you can go to this fashion, fashion show, show or get a tachfif How much <laughs> on your tickets? Did I use that correctly? <laughs> the shit that this guy like <laughs> you get a tachfif on your tickets. You get a little discount, or maybe right not such nice. a little discount. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Not that's a good. tashdid, a tachfif <laughs> You Ooh, see? Nice, nice, yeah, nice. Right. I'm proud of you. I'm proud Thank you, of you. Yeah, I'm proud Captain Reza. Yes, Thank yes. you, Captain. <laughs> we are coming to you on rookmedia.com. It's there that you can link to all of our platforms. We're on an ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian di- diaspora identity. We're on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Instagram, and CastBox. If you like to see some visuals with Rook, switch over to YouTube right now. And if you like your Rook descriptions and bulletins in, in both English and Persian, check us out on Telegram. Our Telegram channel is, qu- is going uh, growing quite uh, quickly. Um, I had a little trouble with the Tashdeed on uh, <laughs> going there. Uh, if you uh, want to support us, which we would really appreciate, you can become a sponsor of this program. Contact us through our website or at info at rookmedia.com or become a patron. It's really simple. You just go to our website, press the support us button. And for um, a few bucks a month, you can be a, a supporter of Rook and that uh, helps us going. Rookmedia.com. Now, later in the show... We have letters. This is a big yeah. show. Got a lot going on in yeah, this program. I know. We have, uh, so we've got Nikki, we got Golshid, uh, and then Golshid Mola. Golshid right? Mola, baby. And then, and then uh, before we get to our letters, um, we're going to bring somebody in who's a member of the, who's in the Toronto Iranian community. And she's got this idea to, um, based on something she's told me that they used to do in mm-hmm. villages in Iran, it's called Ashe Arezu. Wow. Where you crowd create an osh to hand out to all members of the community and beyond. It's a really beautiful, positive idea. I know she's done it in Toronto for the last couple of years. We've actually wow. been the recipient of uh, a couple of these oshes. Um, she'll describe more of what, what the whole uh, plan is, how you do this. But they're going to do it on the, the summer uh, Equinox on June twenty first, Ashe Arezu, and they're going to do it in Toronto, and and we think they should do it all over the world. Like people yeah. listening should do their own Ashe Arezus. Such a cool thing. Ash being for those who are listening who are not um, stew. I guess soup. it's like a Persian stew. Persian mm-hmm. stew. I mean, I've seen it called a Persian noodle soup, but it really does a disservice to, yeah. <laughs> to Rook to like call a it really a really thick no. stew. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's a very yeah. hearty stew. Lots of calories. Mm. Not necessarily meat in it. Oh, yeah, mm. there is always meat. There isn't always meat. There isn't always meat. I don't think there, needs to be meat. there is no meat in it. So stew yeah. doesn't have to have meat in it, does it? No. Well, stew doesn't. No, I okay. guess no. You can have a vegetarian stew. So, yeah, so it is a stew. Actually, then. it's a good question. Stew. I feel Does like stew should have meat in it. I feel like we have to Google stew now. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> not only do we know, no, oh. not know the translation, we don't know the English word. <laughs> <laughs> what, we don't what, is, know. what does stew mean? Oh, boy. <laughs> but. <laughs> It's a Persian soup <laughs> that, that has spicing. This show for English language <laughs> that has uh, <laughs> it's very tasty. There's different derivations of ash. There's, yes. as you say, ash reshte. There's ash sabzi, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? Vegetable there's ash kashk. Ah, kash. Yeah. There's ash tashdid. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> there isn't. That, no, ash shole. Ash shole. Oh, yeah. there's an ash shole. Yeah, yeah. Shole or shole galamkar. Shole galamkar, but usually. Okay, let me explain. Shole. Captain Reza's last name is actually Shole. It's not Shole. It's Shole, like the oh fire. Boy. 
شعله and there's an آشه شعل شعله I don't know if it's آشه شعل قلم کار or شعل قلم کار I have no idea is this interesting to anyone definitely not to me I zoned out 10 minutes ago but are you a fan of آش of course I'm a fan of آش no one dislikes آش no one I defy our listeners mm-hmm. around the world. Tell me if you don't like. I want to find somebody who's, who's tried it. Not a fan of all. yes. Who's well. tried it? Because a lot of people like don't eat it because they don't like the look of it. Like no, taste it. And but not Iranians though. Yeah. Surely there's yeah, no, no Iranian walking Iranians, the face of the earth they're that, wrong, Iranians, that doesn't yeah. like the look of yeah, Ash. Yeah, yeah, like some 18 year old kid. Who What's was wrong born with the look of Ash? Is like. Trust me, I've seen kids like 15, 16 year olds. They look at it. He like, sometimes ah. says things that, and then he has to. <laughs> we have to off. trust him. <laughs> he calls it art, I with, believe. <laughs> with Trump facts, trust me. Okay, Asha Arzu. We'll get to that later in the show. Hey, a big thanks to Katy Kavandi Immigration for support with this episode. This is a full service immigration firm that offers all inland and overseas immigration services, including temporary visas, permanent visas, PR extensions, citizenship applications. Katy and her team are available to inform and assist you as their client throughout the whole immigration process. So due to the current inflation and dollar rate in the Middle East and Iran, Katy Kavandi Immigration are flexible to their agreement fees and are considering up to a 20% discount to their fees to new clients till the end of July. If you want to come to Canada, if you are here already and you need support, if you need an immigration counselor, Katy is your person. Katy Kavandi Immigration Services on Instagram. You can find her and the company at katy.com. Kavandi.immigration. Nice. So on the weekend, uh, a few of us from the Rook team mm-hmm. had a little uh, excursion to fun. the Ali Azimi show, yes. which was at the uh, Opera House in Toronto. It was yeah. really fun to see like a kind of a big rock show. Our friend up there doing doing great, great band. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't go to a lot of concerts. This is like a, it was an interesting experience. I've never been actually to a Persian concert. That's no I, way. Oh, I sort of got I've never been. No it's my first time. Ebi no, no, Ebi. No, no, no. Well, they're Shaka. not my kind of singers. And right. Like, um, and and this was like not a typical Persian concert. No, it wasn't. No, this That's is a, the more of a exactly. pop rock concert. Yeah. yeah. So like my favorite singers are like I don't know Farhad like in the Iranian mm-hmm. ones and he's like that <laughs> but it's, okay. he, but and, and Ali is a friend obviously mm-hmm. and he invi- invited you and you took me as your plus one yes. graciously <laughs> can, I, can I say it was really cute uh, yeah, Reza was cute. going to uh, I mean for me as somebody who oh. basically lived in rock clubs <laughs> for the 15 years of my life uh, <laughs> and played in them it's really cute uh, Reza texts me the like a couple hours before the show and he's like um, what should I wear to the I'm like I don't know. I'm like no, that, you, that is so cute. I was like, well, you're going to see a band play. What do you mean? What do you? Because here's the thing. Like this is me for uh, for people who can't see, uh, which would be everybody who's listening to us. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm like a casual like yeah kind of guy, right? But then, but I, I think was, it's because you got mixed up with these Persians now. No, not the North talking, North Toronto Persians that thing, want you to dress this. up. So you know, Ebi's concert was like a few days ago, whatever, right? right? So my parents wanted to go to that concert. Uh-huh. So I got them tickets. That's uh, nice And they you. like that. Yeah, they like that. So they, they had a concert in Holland a couple of years ago. Like, they went there. And I told them, they were like, where are you going? Uh, it was late at night. I was coming to see you guys. And then I was just wearing what I was wearing. Like, mm-hmm. And then my mom, I, was, I told my mom, I'm going to a concert. Ali Azimi, she was like, you're going to concert <laughs> looking like that? Right. I'm like, looking like what? That's so sweet. She, yeah, she was like, yeah. nah, baba, yeah. Kuchalwari. Goftam for concert. Gof, are, azizam, concert ironi, mage to narafti. Goftam na. Gof, ebi, gugu, shamina ke Kian just said. You gotta dress up. Like a gala event. Yeah, like a gala event. I was like, then I called, then I told you, I'm like, yo, <laughs> what am I supposed to wear? He's like, Buddy, it's a rock concert. Like, <laughs> I don't really know. Sweet. Like, I liked it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, Keon, we missed you there. Yeah, I was gonna say I wasn't invited. I well, didn't. I wasn't yeah. anybody's plus one. There is a uh, concert in Toronto. We thought <laughs> yeah, maybe no. if you show, show some interest, you would, you could come along. <laughs> Not a single text. I'm and everybody in town was in that concert. I saw. Yeah, yeah. yeah I saw everybody's social media. I was like, <laughs> oh, that's nice. I was yeah. left out. Yeah, it kind of was. A, it, <laughs> it was. was a, but it was. A, 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 I mean, the Opera House is a great place. Yeah. To but see I loved it. it. You know what? I a lot of musicians too. Oh yeah. We saw a lot of musicians coming out. Partly, I think you know why because. 
because uh, obviously because we think Ali's great, but the band too. Oh yeah, mm. he had Paymon on Sally Me, yes. and he had Yahya on the on the drums, yeah, yeah. and uh, Orin Kishishi on bass. That's He's right, amazing. and I just love and that Dario crowd. played uh, cello. cello. Shout yeah, out yeah. to Dario. Yeah. I love that crowd. Like everybody, like every other person would walk up to us and be like, "Yo, you guys are from Rock. You're so and so." Like it was just it was it was interesting. I love I love that yeah. crowd. Yeah, they were, there were a lot of Rook fans there. It was a really nice. Yeah. yeah, shout out to all of you guys. Yeah, yeah, we really appreciate folks who came yeah. up to us. Aren't you guys that. glad Keon wasn't there? <laughs> we are for sure. No, no what ruined. is the? Why would you say <laughs> that? No, yeah, you know why? You. Because she called me stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't call you. I didn't use you that said word. Something along I those would lines. never call you stupid. <laughs> that was my interpretation. You're very. You're great. She rather. needs to um, <laughs> use a different tashdid when she <laughs> yes, says stupid. 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 Um, all right, so Kian, we have some letters. Yes, we do. Uh, we'll get to those later. We'll get get to Golshid Mola. We'll get to Oshe Arezu, but let's get to our first guest. I know she's uh, on the line waiting. My first guest today is a talented young Iranian-American violinist who is gaining popularity for her performances on social media and concert stages around the world. Take a listen to this. Taste of Nikki Nakavi performing Meditation by Jules Massenet at the Boston Philharmonic Rising Star event this past month. So, Nikki was born in Dallas, Texas to Iranian parents. She started playing the violin from an early age, the age of four to be exact. She's now 21, but she's already performed at esteemed halls throughout Europe and the U.S., such as Royal Albert Hall, Carnegie Hall, Round Top Music Festivals. Nikki has served as the concert master of the Texas All-State Symphony Orchestra, the Boston Philharmonic Youth Orchestra, the Greater Dallas Youth Orchestra, and the New England Conservatory Symphony Orchestra on several occasions. She's the co-founder of Through the Staff, an organization that provides free online musical lessons to young musicians who could otherwise not afford or have access to them. And she's currently studying at the New England Conservatory of Music with Ayano Ninomiya. She's built a huge social media following as well and with her self-effacing personality and impressive playing. And right now, Nikki Naravi joins me from Dallas, Texas today. Hello. Hi, how are you? Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I love that you have the Persian GH in your last name like I do. How do how do the Americans fare with Nakavi? <laughs> you know, I sometimes I get Nagahavi, adding a few vowels in there. Nag they they're usually pretty good. It usually ends up going to Nagavi, which is fine. You can handle that. <laughs> yeah. I mean the, the 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 silent H is definitely confusing though. It adds adds all kinds of interesting uh, derivations even outside of Starbucks, right? <laughs> Starbucks. <laughs> Starbucks. The Starbucks name. Um, that was that. What we just played of you, Nikki. That was like that was just a couple of weeks ago, and you were performing at this Boston Philharmonic event. Like this is not a you know local talent show. I mean, not so bad. H how did that feel for you? It was incredible. Um, you know, every time I go on stage, no matter the magnitude of the event, I still get nervous. Um, that's I think that's a part of life, and that's a part of you know, giving a lot of importance to what you're doing. But it was an amazing experience, nevertheless. Um, even at your advanced age, you still get nervous. Yes. I, I And I don't think that's going to stop anytime soon. It's definitely, I've, I've found ways to calm myself down, um, different techniques that work for me or that I recommend to my students. But um, I think I think that a lot of people would feel the, say the same thing if you asked them. Do you you started playing well yes that's absolutely true that um uh, uh in fact Tony Bennett once told me and he, at the time he was probably in his early 80s said he still gets butterflies when he goes on stage and I and to me that's probably the mark of a great artist who uh, always wants to perform well right um you don't you don't you don't want it to ever become too comfortable um 
you started playing when you were four. <laughs> is that is yeah. that is that the case? Yeah, with the with our, whatever toy violin we could find that fits me at that age. Um, but I started playing when I was four and been playing ever since. You know, sometimes I think the greatest advantage in life is to know at a young age what it is that you love and what it is that you want to do. Was it you going to your parents at the age of four going, I want to be a violinist? How did it happen? No, absolutely not. It happened to be something I fell into. My parents kind of put me in a lot of things when I was younger, sports, um, music lessons. They went to the music store, let me point to which instrument I wanted. Thankfully, it wasn't the harp. <laughs> That's really um, you know, a hassle to carry around. But I or, the, the or the drums. Or the drums. Right. <laughs> um, I did the violin. I, I played soccer. I was really important. I was the bench warmer, you know, no, <laughs> just bad joke. I'm not a comedian for a reason. Um, you know, school and everything went fine, but violin just kept calling me back to the practice room every day after school, um, going to lessons, you know, during the week, on the weekends, playing in different youth groups and orchestras and making some of my best friends and connections through music mm. kind of pushed me over the edge of like, hmm, this is something I can really see myself doing for the rest of my life. Do you, do you remember when it became something that you love as opposed to something that your parents were making you take or something that you sort of felt like you had to do after school, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. I'd say there's like two pretty specific instances. One, I think around the age of middle school, I just started to, when we, in, in Texas, public schools, middle school is, grade six is when we begin to have electives. And I joined the school orchestra at that time because I'd been playing for a while and I, I wasn't starting fresh. I was put in the top group and that kind of gave me like a confidence of like, oh, you know, I'm meeting these older kids and, you know, I'm like leading the section or something, even when I'm when I'm younger than them. So that was kind of, that made me like think, oh, maybe I should be mm. practicing on my own without my parents telling me to. The other thing that happened, and this is something you mentioned, um, the Texas All-State Orchestra, in high school, there was one instance we were playing this piece that, you know, with a huge 130, 140-piece orchestra, we're all coming together to create one creature, one, you know, result. But within that, my role was, you know, to communicate with every section. And I'm, I'm a big people person. And to be able to do that through music, I think, gave me this idea of like, wow, I mm. really am enjoying this performance, this playing time. This is something that I, I really want to do in the future. You, you know, I mean, the, the only you that I really know is, uh, uh, I mean, we've had one conversation earlier, but I, I, I know you from your social media. And in your social media, you always have your violin with you. And I kind of, I don't know if this is a romantic, romanticized version that I of you that I have, but I almost see this person who probably has always been walking around with her violin, at least in, in recent years. Is that true? Is it like your your baby that you carry wherever you go? I would say so. Um, it's always my carry-on when I'm in the airplane. <laughs> it's always like, if I you know actually move a little, you'll see it's on my bed oh, it's right a, yeah. Taking a nap. Never so, too yeah, far away. You pretty keep much. It in- I mean, at the point of you know like going into it as a career, I can't really take too many days off or... And a lot of my traveling I do is because of music, because of the violin. So, yeah, it pretty much goes wherever I go. This isn't to say that I, <laughs> I don't slack off because I probably haven't seriously practiced in like the past week. Um. I, I don't I don't think you do slack off, actually. I think we'll get to that. I mean, but I, I, I don't. Th- does your does your violin have an like, there was a famous um, blues guitarist named B.B. King who had a guitar that he always was always with him named Lucille. Does your violin have a name? It actually does. Um, the one I'm, I'm playing on currently doesn't belong to me. It's on loan from a foundation um, on scholarship. But the one that I own, the one that I've been playing on most of my life, is named Charlie. I, I, it's a French violin, so I, I thought I would <laughs> name it Charlie. Right, um, right. This is quite new, though, so I don't have a name for it yet. The, 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 the famous Iranian uh, name, Charlie, yes. <laughs> And does your does this loner violin not violate Charlie? Does Charlie not feel cheated on? A little bit. I, I you know, go back to Charlie every every few months to just let him know I'm still here for him and 
you know that that will be reuni- reunited once again right. but uh for you now see, i this, do want to take advantage of this one this is what happens when you become a star there's a new of a new violin walks into your life charlie is left you know he's not even in the room he's in where is charlie <laughs> in boston actually. oh he's in boston <laughs> charlie didn't even get to come on the trip back to dallas oh wow this is a, d- a disaster for Charlie. Uh, by the way, the fact that the violin is in the same room as you, I, I might ask you to pick it up at some point and play something if that's uh, if you'd be okay with that. Absolutely. Yeah. So you come from an Iranian family of, from what I understand, engineers, accomplished professionals. Your dad's a civil engineer. Your mom is a computer scientist. Um, where, where does the artistic side of you come from in all of that? From a young age, I was exposed to a lot of music. My parents, my whole family, in fact, are all music lovers. Um, although I don't really have many musicians in the family, especially none in my direct bloodline. So I don't really know where it comes from. I guess just maybe their passion and their interest in music, not only Western classical, but also traditional Iranian music. Um, my grandfather on my dad's side was a poet. So, and you know, my dad is, you know, going to sleep every night these days listening to like traditional poetry. Mm. It's just very calming for him. And so I guess some of that love like transferred down to me. Um, But I think just the amount of time that I spent with it made me realize how much I enjoy like playing and collaborating with others. I mean, your parents were the ones who first put you in the violin, put the violin in your hand, but uh, how how has the negotiation been with this becoming the focus of your of your life given that you come from this lineage of computer scientists to engineer etc are they have, have they always been cool with it it was it was funny because it's it was a struggle they're investing so much time and like patience into me and making me practice taking me to my violin lesson every week and then when i got to the end of high school and i turned around and told them yeah i think i want to do this as a career they were like oh God, no, like, what did we do? (laughs) Um, There was quite a bit of pushback in the beginning. I I wouldn't say it's completely gone yet. There's still this want, this desire for me to become an accountant. Really? Like, really now? Even despite your, I mean, you just played with the Boston Philharmonic. I mean, is that not Um, enough? No, well, I mean, they're really proud of what I do. But and I understand, like, the tradition and just, you know, to make a living in being comfortable as a musician is kind of hit or miss a lot of times, regardless of how talented you or hardworking you may be. And so I think, you know, their, their desire for me to explore other things comes out of just like a, protection over me right I'm an only of course child, yeah. <laughs> but but i thought you get kind of a pass when you're when it's a an esteemed uh classical instrument like you're not exactly playing bass in a punk band you know like you're like <laughs> <laughs> you're you know you're playing a very noble it's the violin you know there's like you know conjures up an opera house with people dressed up going to see you perform and uh, i mean doesn't that help yeah I, I i definitely think that they're glad it's violin over like jazz drums no shade to my jazz drummer friends i love them all but um you know so they're they're proud of what i do and they can relate to it a lot more uh i played in a norus festival a couple years ago in dallas mm. and that's probably like the first time they saw me i learned some bijan more tasavi and uh you know i i played on the stage and like the house was like went wild because they're seeing this like you know young girl american playing like iranian or like iranian inspired music um stuff that's familiar to them as well and i think when my parents like heard all this praise from like their friends and family and right people in the community that's when they realized oh like because they're they're not like super exposed to the western classical world Mm. you know they're not Shostakovich like scholars or you know they don't know all the Mahler or Beethoven symphonies but something that they're more familiar with and you know hearing that you know I did it well I think gave them a little more of that confidence of like oh okay this is something maybe she can do playing the old Bijan Mortazavi uh, tune sealed the deal huh <laughs> basically <laughs> 
Um, uh, first of all, I mean, who? Uh, this is probably very insulting to those. I know there's a bunch of folks who listen to us in Texas, but who knew there was a Norus festival in Dallas? What kind of an Iranian community is there? And uh, and what was it like growing up as an Iranian kid in Texas for you? I think um, Dallas is really the only place I've lived with the exception of going to school in Boston. But I think there's quite a, you know, sizable Iranian community here. We have like a magazine called Padastu. We're actually friends with, um, my, my parents go long time way back with the, the person who sets up the Noru's event and runs the Majale Padastu. And uh, says we have like a Charshan Besuri festival and lots of like aid fest festivities. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, as far as I know, there's a pretty good sized community here I didn't have a ton of Iranian friends growing up. Um, the few that I knew came from my parents' mutual friends mm-hmm. and who had kids. But my parents are a little on the older side, so they did all their Mehmuni stuff mostly before I was born. Um, so that's that's why I don't have as many. Growing up in like public school in Texas as an Iranian, some people don't really like they have no idea. My my the right. way I look is a little You're quite angry. fair actually. So you don't yeah. but you've got that and Right. And, and I also just dyed my hair back from blonde from the past four years to like natural, like dark brown. Um so, you know, I've gotten like Latina. Mm. Um but you know, a lot of my friends who do look a little more from that part of the world have been called like terrorist or, you know, kind of just like bad stuff. Um I, I, I mean I was gonna say I know it's a Obviously, it's a stereotype, and I've been to Texas enough times and have enough friends there to know that this is not a characterization that fits for all Texans, obviously. But there is that stereotype, that image of the the American Republican kind of uh, gun toting Texan, you know. And I always wonder uh, in a place like Dallas where the where the Iranians fit in, what it, what it's like for you. Obviously, it's going to be very different from a, a place like Toronto now, where Toronto is you know hundreds of thousands of Iranians here, so you can easily find that community. But it sounds like it wasn't that big a deal for you or hasn't been it wasn't yeah personally for me um but i definitely you know like sitting across from my fellow classmates and you know hearing the way they talk about their their guns and their um closets or you know just you know they're going shooting the right in the with the rifle next weekend and it's yeah it's that culture especially where i live in dallas North Texas is, you know, pretty like Republican and everything. Now I think a lot more immigrants have moved into North Texas and our population is diversifying very quickly. So I think in the past few years, it's been a lot less of that kind of vibe, um, like during high school for me, for example, but definitely in elementary school, it was very apparent that I looked different from like the person who sat right next to me. You you speak. I think you're like me. You can speak Persian, but you don't read or write, right? Yeah. And how did you learn to speak Persian? I grew up in a house with my grandparents on my dad's side. Um, we lived together for the first seven eight years of my life, and my grandparents don't speak any Farsi, so Farsi was my first. They don't language. speak any English. You mean? Sorry, they don't speak yeah. English. Yeah. Um, Farsi was my first language. I went to English second language or ESL growing up in wow. elementary school. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but then because of school and the nature of, you know, friendships and everything, it quickly override, overrode Farsi. Uh, so now But I love I'm, it. You're born in Dallas and your first language was Persian. Yeah. I mean, I'm lucky to have a very large family living in the U.S. right now. And mm. so... I think my parents expected that English would quickly take over, so they tried to instill as much Farsi in me when I was young as they could, um, which I'm really thankful for, except I don't read or write, which is on me because they very much pushed me to do so, but I resisted a little bit. You know, um, this is, I don't mean to go too far into a sidebar here, but just to get your uh, get your take on it. And I'm interested, you know, uh, and I'm interested to hear, for, for example, what your what you, what your parents have said about this. That we we often talk about um, 
some of the horrible conditions in Iran and the atrocities that take place in Iran and the things that make us very sad and frustrated and angry. Um, there was a this horrible um, school shooting in Texas not that long ago. Uh, now I know you were probably in Boston at the time, but but h- how do you and and your family deal with situations like that? Um, it's very heartbreaking to think about because this is, I mean, this happens everywhere. So horrible things happen all over the world, um, in the U.S., in Texas, just as much as the Middle East, sure. just as much as Europe or anywhere else. Um, it wasn't like extremely close to me in close to where I live, but a lot of friends I have live in the San Antonio, I believe Uvalde is the, the school that mm-hmm. had the shooting at. Um, and it's just, it's really, really sickening to know, you know, that it's easier to get a gun than a driver's license in Texas mm. or, you know, to reach legal drinking age. And, uh, it's just, yeah, it's, I don't really have too much to say about it just because of it's, I think it's very clearly a horrible thing that, you know, should be restrained more than than it is right now right. and a lot of people and politicians in this state aren't so keen on you know changing that for their own political agendas and it's just hopefully like the generation that rises up and um takes over is gonna be a, you know think thinking about the things that have happened in their own youth and growing up and make changes based on that well said. Yeah, well said. I mean, uh, and fair to say your ammunition is your violin. Uh, that That's what you're packing, right? Yeah. So um, it takes a lot of discipline to become great at an instrument. You know, I, I can't imagine you've become as good as you are, as fast as you have at your age without um, a lot of work at this. Are you a super focused person? Yes. Um, I've become more focused in the past few years as well, just with adding work. I would say in the beginning, uh, you know, I would come home from school and it was, you know, at four, six, eight years old, I didn't want to, you know, come home and grab the violin out of the case and practice my long bows every day, you know, when I could go play in the playground or hang out with my friends or go shopping or something, eat some ice cream. Um, but my parents really pushed me to do that, not to a crazy, like, you know, unhealthy point. They've also, they've always had give me the option to quit if I wanted to. Mm. But I think um, just thinking about the amount of time and effort that I'd put into it made me feel like quitting wasn't an option and for myself. And it would just have been a waste of everything. So I kept going. Again, like I said, the older I got, the more I just naturally you know, did that work myself. When, when college started, I also started working a lot more. I'd say during the pandemic is when I shifted. My calendar mm. became booked every single hour, whether it's like driving from one place to another or teaching for two and a half hours and then, you know, leaving time to practice. Sometimes I, I, I can, I think it's a little bit too much to the point where I notice myself you know, if, if someone is talking to me, I notice myself almost thinking about, okay, what do I have to do in the next hour? Which I don't think is very respectful at mm-hmm. all to the, you know, to my friend, if I'm communicating with them or, you know, uh, which is, and that's something that I really want to work on myself. So I think I may have tipped over a little bit too mm-hmm. far, but I'm, I'm really trying to. Well, really I, I have to say as a highly organized and probably, um, I would definitely OCD person myself that I actually think that's awesome. <laughs> I think that's amazing. <laughs> she plans every hour. Brilliant, you know, but yes, it's probably a little overdone. I mean, look, there's, there's lots of stories of, you know, great figure skaters or, or um, football players or pianists uh, who don't even have a sort of sense of social relationships because they've had to, they've been so focused in terms of what they, they do in their life. And is that 
Has it been the case for you where there's a lot of there's there's situations where your friends are all going out to the the pub or something and and you kind of go no I got to stay home and play my violin. Definitely um, much more in the past than I think after the pandemic it made me kind of realize you know life is too short to only focus on one thing or just like profession. I I try to really diversify what I do. And in fact, even within music, it's interesting because I go to a conservatory where, I mean, there's international competition winners. Like these people are seriously like crazy talented. But, and then there's one person who might spend six, seven hours in a practice room every day. I definitely don't spend that time in a practice room, but I spend my time working, connecting with people, um, freelancing, gigging around Boston or exploring the city. And so, um, I think I'm, I'm a lot happier doing the diverse things that I'm doing rather than, mm. you know, even though that person is, you know, really technically, you know, into it and they can probably play a lot better than I do. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to think about the bigger picture and, and see how, how I can transform this into a career that is going to satisfy the way I want to live in the future. Well, that's interesting. That's going to satisfy the way you want to live. What does that mean? How do you want to live? Just, I, you know, like a lot of people in the music world are like paycheck to paycheck. Mm. And, you know, there's the whole starving artist dilemma, which is very true, unfortunately, because a lot of people aren't willing to pay money for mm. buying albums or supporting artists, um, especially rising artists, because not everyone can just grow up and be like one direction right off the bat Mm -hmm. so for me like the ultimate goal would be to like add my passions and Mm -hmm. musical and business side of things to create something that uh can support me and my family in the future and uh live out the dream of music did you just name check one direction do you mean the band yeah, I, I isn't couldn't that, isn't, think it's kind of a date. Else. It's a dated reference. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, it's like from, it's like from 15 years ago or something. <laughs> I expected you I, to be on top of things. You know, uh, that's that's fantastic. <laughs> well, how, how motivated are you by the desire to be great? I mean, how how much is greatness important to you? Do you want to be the the best violinist in history? No, absolutely not. Uh, I think if I did, I would be spending a lot more time practicing and just with the instrument by itself. Really what motivates me the most is uh, two things, accessibility to music education for kids um, who don't have that access, uh, as well as just breaking down the stigma of classical music being like a really snooty, um, stigmatized like art form, mm. just for the general public. Wow, that's really refreshing to hear that those are your your goals. I'm going to get to the the teaching and accessibility thing that um, uh, piece that you're uh, that you've made a priority for you. But uh, uh, let me ask you about the the breaking barriers and and your popularity. I mean, you've become very well known in social media. You have over eighty thousand followers on Instagram, uh, in in which you mostly just play violin uh, you know you're not doing anything outside of that uh, does it surprise you that you've built that kind of following yeah I'm like every day I, I, I look at it I'm like I, I post the video that I made and I'm just like I don't know why people like this but they seem to like it based on what they've done before so um, yeah it's really surprising to me also because I'm always like I mentioned surrounded by these other musicians at my school who are just honestly so much better than I am um I just think that I've taken the route of like sharing that and cultivating what people like mixing that with the instrument and then producing something that adds value so when so when you say you just post it I mean be honest that the show's called the rook means you know be blunt I mean um how much do you look at analytics or you do you look at what's catching on and what isn't in terms of the things you post uh, how much do you actually think about all of that and plan all of that and how much is it just you sort of throwing things up there that happen to get thousands of views Quite a bit. I, I really do look at uh, my analytics quite a bit. I just I try to continue studying the market and seeing what's working and what's not. I, I, I have studied a bit by myself how to kind of get to that point. So I think that's helped a lot. 
in the way that I share my content and okay, so you, more, you're, you're not yeah. that surprised then. I mean, you you probably have a a good idea of why it is that you've got um, more followers than some of your talented friends in 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 Boston or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what 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 do you think it is? What is it that has uh, that has catapulted you in social media? I always make the similar the, the comparison between a post to a concert or an event. Mm. Someone is going to buy a ticket to a concert that either they haven't listened to the music live before, they like they haven't seen that band, or um, it's it's just not something repetitive for them. It's something that's interesting, going to add value, unique, maybe thought provoking for them, and because someone is you know giving their money that they worked for for that ticket. I think it's the same way with a view on a video. No one's going to watch the video or press that follow button if it's just the same thing that they can see or have mm. seen on someone else's page. Um, and so in my, in my videos, and I think what has gotten a lot of attention is that I try to share a lot of the authentic side mm -hmm. of being a musician. So, you know, mistakes or literally... I remember there was one time I'm just in my room um, trying to record something and I just I can't get it. There's so many times that I've gotten like to the middle of the piece and I'm just like like I say like a curse word and and I like end the video. And then I was thinking at the end when I finished everything like I probably have enough videos that I can clip <laughs> these like ends together and just show how much trial and error it and, takes. And do you know what your most popular reel is? That's definitely yeah, one of them. Yeah, let me let me actually we've got it queued up because I wanted to die. so let, this is Nikki Nagavi and her flaws. Take a listen to this. <laughs> I mean, it's, I love that. Yeah. I love that you post that. I, that. I mean, that is clearly. I would think that that's something that there's another one too of you doing a vocal lesson, which where, where you're clearly, um, you know, not singing at your best. And uh, uh, and I knew that that had to be a conscious decision to sort of put that out there, um, which which really um, makes one like you, but also it, um, it, it kind of makes anybody else who feels like they have flaws feel like that, uh, you're not perfect. Right. And, and so that they feel like a closeness with you. Yeah. Um, I think the first time that I did it and I've, I've done them every so often for years now, but the, the first time I did it, the amount of replies I got of like, Oh my gosh, I thought I was the only one or, like no way this happens to you too like what i thought you know i thought this was only a me thing or just a beginner thing i'm i'm like no absolutely not it was it was actually mind blowing to me to see how many people didn't realize that perfect or people i guess professionals since i'm i'm studying it as a profession go through this stuff too even the greatest artists who you you know pay hundreds of dollars to go to their concerts playing with the new york philharmonic or berlin phil you know Everyone goes through mistakes, and um, like even the recordings that I take, um, that I, I really try for, and I put the final result. I have always kind of been under the impression that people know that this isn't a first take type of video. Mm. This is like I, sh I share a screenshot of like my camera roll, and it has like maybe 20, 30 different tries, and I'm like, this is the reality of it, and uh, I think. For me, it's it's always really important to connect to someone, make them feel comfortable, whether it's online or in person. And I think that's one route of doing it online. I think that that authenticity does really come out, Nikki. And I'm, I wouldn't be surprised at all if that's why you've built this massive following. Um, and at the same time, you know, your channel, your what you're doing is, is quite focused. Like you don't have... Um, in terms of what we're used to seeing on on some in social media, you do, there aren't a lot of like videos of you eating tacos or a picture of here's my new outfit or you know it's 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 usually you just playing the violin. Tell me about that choice. I actually and Instagram is really the only social media that I'm quite active on. I had a personal account that was really just friends and family. Um, 
that I would post more of that stuff, again, not super often as much as I do violin, then I decided, you know, I think, let me just go for this brand. Let me just really show very strong representation of like this Instagram is for um, violin and for musical purposes, educational uh, or entertainment. And so again, it kind of goes back to that ticket thing. No one really, for the purpose of building a brand online, no one really cares that much about seeing you eat a taco or checking out your new outfit. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm doing a little bit more of that now that I've deleted my other personal account. Um, I try to just share most of my life on here. But I, most of my life, I think that's worth really sharing is violin. Um, mm. So yeah, I try not although, to. Like although that. you know, people do go to concerts by by that concert ticket. If you want to use that metaphor, for a variety of reasons too. You might go right. because you think the performer is cute. You might go because you you like their personality. You might go because other people you know like it. Uh, you know, uh, be. I mean, would it bother you if people are following you because beyond the the violin, uh, beyond no. just your playing? No, and I. Um I've gotten quite a few marriage requests in my <laughs> in my messages from the middle aged men out in I don't know where, but uh, and a lot of people follow me actually because I'm Iranian because they see the flag in my bio and it's like oh you know I get a lot of comments that are like proud of you Iranian girl like young you know like promoting yeah. the culture or like Iranian music or just you know my my representing showing a picture of Gorma Sabzi on my story. <laughs> Yeah. So, how did yeah. uh, tell me how that feels for you? Because I know that you actually have followers um, in in Iran who've found you. So um, I mean, I, I have my own experience with this that I where I feel really um, that to, to know that there's people who are listening to us right now in Iran really warms my heart. And I'm not even trying to play favorites to them. You know, the, you guys who are listening right now in Tabriz or Shiraz or whatever, it, it just makes me as a kid who grew up from, with that ancestry, but outside of Iran, it really makes me feel um, a sense of belonging in a strange way. You, you, you're you born in Dallas. You're this Texan girl. Uh, uh, and he, here you are. And, and these people who are in Iran, um, maybe some of whom would never even be able to come to the United States feel like you're one of them and, and you're representing. How does that feel for you? It's something I'm extremely grateful for, um, to have that community of support and feel like you said, like that sense of belonging. Because yes, I'm a born in America and I'm really much, probably much more American than I am Iranian. Um, but I really do feel like a big, a very strong Persian presence in my life. You know, we put the half scene every year and a Farsi half me and it's like, and that shapes a lot of who I am as a person. Mm -hmm. And so to know that it's, it's not just, you know, like my family, that's just where they're from, but it's a, it's this community. It's this country that I have roots and ancestry from. Um, and that a lot of my own self and personality comes from that's really like, I'm, I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud to be Iranian and to be able to share. I'm, I'm lucky that, you know, I'm able to share things so easily. And uh, it's amazing, you know, with all the sanctions against Iran and, mm -hmm. you know, the VPN and just hard the, you know, difficulties to get online that they're deciding to, you know, be a part of my life. Yeah. With, you know, with that, that's like extremely meaningful to me. And, even even um, the the act of putting that flag on, I'm, I'm I'm pretty sure that there would there would be somebody who would come up to you and say, uh, you know what, uh, it's why why are you putting the Iranian flag? You know, th this might not be the best move for your your career. Or, or uh, tell me about that decision. Yeah, um, I mean, like that's a no brainer for me. Like I'm I'm never gonna hide who I am or mm. hide my culture because you know some other you know american like place might not approve of it mm -hmm. as much as they would another flag um that's if you know if someone doesn't approve of my being iranian they can you know leave and not be a part of my life <laughs> right that's, right, that's what right. I am. You, you you also you don't want to imperil the gigs at the Dallas Norus Festival either. I mean, you yeah, want exactly. you yeah, want you got to keep your bread. You got to keep the lunch coming. You know, it's uh, <laughs> the guy. You, he's got a girl's got to make a living. 
Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting. I sometimes Iranian people will send me messages and say, "Why do you have the Iranian flag?" Like, are you Iranian? Like, I'm like, well, my name is Nahavi. <laughs> it's very clear. I play Iranian music. I share picture of Gorma Sabzi. I have the Iranian flag. I, I mean, like, I'm. I don't know if it's them or me. You're just a I'm fetishist. Like, you're just trying to be. You're, you're just. You're just fond of Iranians. You're a Latina who is fond of Iranians. Admit it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Right. Um, so I know it's not Charlie, but you've got the 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 violin sitting uh, on the bed behind you there. Um, do you are you up to playing something for us? Yeah, you let me okay. know and I'll play it. Well, what do I need to let you know? I mean, what? Why don't you play? Well, what do you we feel can like? Do like a little, we can do like a little like request. All right. Like you, as long as I know the song, as long as I've heard it. I can't. I can't pick a deep track off a Radiohead album, can I? I mean, it's. <laughs> I don't know if I can do it. <laughs> Uh, well, I, first of all, why don't you play something? Uh, I'll, 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 here's, I'll have two requests. One is something, um, more classical that you, that you love to play. There was something like a Prokofiev or something that I saw one of your videos that you were, you were playing. You want to play a little taste of something classical first? Then I'm going to ask you about the fact that you cover popular songs and, and, and we'll play uh, one of those. So you go ahead, play us something classical to be with. I'll play um I'll play Vivaldi Spring. Okay. Nice, very nice. This is Nikki Nagavi. That's uh, that's fantastic. Uh, okay, so you have made this decision where you, uh, uh, speaking of ways in which you've um, gained thousands of followers online, you you decide that to, you decide to play cover songs, popular songs that you cover, but on the violin. Uh, tell me when you first had the idea, idea to do that. First of all, I I don't really remember when I started, but the the reason behind my starting kind of goes back to that well for for, for one it's fun like mm. you know just that's it it's fun i've done a lot of gigs uh at weddings for example where they ask me to play a certain song maybe something by elvis presley can't help falling in love for example or a thousand years christina perry um and that stuff it's easy to play if you know it i was i was trained in a very aural way tactile sense so like i it's easier for me to pick up that stuff just from listening to it maybe than learning from purely like notation but um so it was easy it was fast and then i decided you know people like this stuff it's introducing them to the world of classical music uh through the means of a popular artist mm. and so that kind of all fit together the covers are they take me like maybe five minutes to film per song then i you know I usually batch them up, create a lot of them in one day, change my outfit so that it doesn't look like they're all from the same day, um, and then I'll I'll edit them all another day, and then suddenly I have like 15, 16 videos to post. Uh, so the days that I don't practice, which are recently very often, I can just post a video of those, and yeah. So what's a pop song or a popular song that, that people have really liked that you've covered? Um... Maybe this is the only one that's coming to my head is Hips Don't Lie by Shakira. <laughs> oh, I, I haven't seen you my do that one. My favorite song to like, listen to. I listen to that. I like, don't know I how do. you do the Shakira, Shakira on, on violin. Yeah, but. that's the thing. A lot of like music or rap, for example, I love rap and hip hop too, but it's like mostly words and <laughs> yes. rhythm rather than different melodic you know, notes. So it's, I'm like, I can't really cover those, and they're not really interesting if I do, but it's like a little more of that. But you do the Shakira that. melody line, right? Da, 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 yeah. da, da, da. Okay, go ahead. Ha, <laughs> 
<laughs> that's, that's awesome. <laughs> wow, you really, I mean, it's really fun that you have this repertoire that goes from <laughs> playing some, you know, um, classical piece to, to, to Shakira. And you've done these, is it true that you've done these theme nights? Like you did a, a gig somewhere where you did like all uh, Taylor Swift songs on, on violin yeah. or something? Yeah, yeah. So I, I play... Um Part of my like freelance gig work, especially around Boston, is I play for this concert series called Candlelight, which has actually grown to be very popular um, around U.S. and and Europe and Asia, I think a little bit too. Uh, which is it's basically like a very nice candlelit ambiance with a quartet seated in the middle of like you know hundreds hundreds of really pretty candles. It's very aesthetic, and people see the programs online. They buy their tickets. Sometimes it's for the ones I do in Boston, it's usually Taylor Swift, Queen, um, done Valentine's Day programs, Winter, Wonderland, you know, you name it. Um, also sometimes classical. And so there's usually a mix of like these, you know, kind of fun, cute arrangements of songs people know, maybe like from the Red album for Taylor Swift. Yep. And then mixed in with, you know, like something that's kind of similar, more classical. But then it's, it really keep, captures the audience's attention. I and mean, it's also um, mixed with, like we talk to the audience a lot i always ask them how they're doing if they're liking it i invite them to sing along sometimes um if they you know if they're really into it and i always start the program by saying hey look like whose first time it is it at a string quartet concert most people raise their hand and i say look there's this stigma within classical music that you walk in, you sit down in your seat, you have to like stay there, you can't move, you can't talk, you can't clap between movements, you can't even breathe. Um, I try to get them to laugh a little bit. <laughs> yes. <it> works. <laughs> Again, not a comedian for a reason. Um, and then I say like, look, that's not what we believe here at all. We want you guys to be comfortable. If you like something, you're here to enjoy your time. So be comfortable let us know if you like something you can clap along sing along even get up and dance and if you don't like something let us know that too but usually they don't dislike it um and that's been like very very fun for me i've been able to adapt to things a lot quicker like from understanding what the audience likes and what they need uh it's increased my flexibility my public speaking skills my confidence overall i think it's just yeah because um introducing every piece and catering to an audience that's there for a reason is is important i think it comes back to that flexibility within the field that everything doesn't need to be so extremely traditional and yes and I, I and i really appreciate that and applaud that that you're you're basically it sounds like you're saying that you don't just because it's classical music or so-called high art, it, it doesn't have to be precious. It can be for, for everybody, which it, of course it originally was. I mean, it was, you know, it was the, the hip hop of the day, right? I mean, uh, and now it's become this thing where you dress up in a tuxedo to go see it, but, but why not make it um, a popular? What's your position on, um, uh, just out of curiosity, on, uh, on smartphones um, while you're at a concert? Do you think that, are you okay with that? Or do you think that that's crossing the line? Yeah, no, I, <laughs> I've like fallen asleep in my fair share of concerts. I've been on my phone when I need to. Usually I go to a concert and I'm there to enjoy the music. So it's not like I'm, you know, playing Angry Birds on my phone right. while, you know, I should be listening. But like, you know, I, Again, it's back to that comfort if someone needs to take a call or send a quick text to someone saying where they are when they're coming home. That's at a classical concert. Yeah, you're, at a classical concert. You're okay if they, with that. They want to record. I I'm a big fan of that too. Like I, you know, I maybe not with Flash because that you know really goes right, into our eyes right. when we're playing. But besides that, I mean, I I w couldn't say this about all of my colleagues, but um, I'm again always about the comfort of the audience. Hmm. You mentioned you did a Queen night. Can you do um, Bohemian Rhapsody? Yeah. <laughs> really? Okay. I can. <laughs> All right. Um, Which part of the song? I'm gonna I'm see what. Let's see I, where you go I here. I can start the beginning, go to the middle. Oh, you've, uh, do, you got to do the um, Besmella no part for sure. You know. Besmella, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, here, well.
I'm Whoa, gonna- <laughs> that was awesome. You know what? I love what you just did there is you were doing the vocal line. You were doing Freddie Mercury. And then you switched over. You were doing Brian May. You were doing the guitar solo part. <laughs> you, know, the, you were doing various parts on the violin as, as we go through the song. But just, just to, before you, you, do, you put the violin away, I'm sorry, I don't mean to indulge us here, but just to placate and please the Persian audience, do you, yeah. do you, is there something Persian that you can, I mean, I probably wouldn't recognize it necessarily, but is there a famous Persian piece that you play? Okay. All right. People, you'll know this one too. It's pretty. I mean, okay. if I know it, I'm sure you would know. All right. That's beautiful. I do recognize that. Ah, John and Maria. Oh, that was beautiful. I, I know I can't keep you forever, and so um, um, before I let you go, I first of all thank you so much for for doing this and for playing. That was really really a treat. Tell me about through the staff because um, it's it's interesting to me that you've not just. Um, uh, built your own um, pedigree and your own career and 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 now the social media piece and all of that but you as you mentioned earlier one of the big reasons why you you're you want to build this career is to give back and you were instrumental in founding this thing called through the staff tell us what it is yeah so through the staff is an organization I co-founded with a few of my friends from Harvard and um, down in Miami as well as New England Conservatory where I go to school and uh, the concept was during COVID the pandemic hit and pretty much everything closed and so you know a big part of our lives growing up has been like community music centers or um, just places where kids can go and get music lessons at low cost or free depending on you know what it is and so we're seeing all these kids who basically don't have that anymore and it's it's hard to see that so we we're all from different places around the US we luckily have different connections but a lot of the same overlapping and so we decided to pool together basically all of our friends ask them if they would be willing to essentially donate an hour of their week every week to teach a young kid who either doesn't have means to afford music lessons or doesn't live in an area where they're accessible um, distance wise and so we pulled them together we matched them with kids in primarily low income areas to take these private lessons um, week to week in classical instruments the entire orchestra band all the instruments percussion as well as jazz some vocal some conducting mm. we had music theory piano everything um, you could really think of and at the end we had like hundreds of kids matched with students on the rosters we were if you put a conservative like forty dollar an hour lesson fee we were essentially donating hundreds of thousands per semester of music lessons to these kids um, and since then uh, the founding members have we've had different ideas of where we want the company or the the organization to head and a lot of us got very busy with school and ourselves um, I definitely think we put in a lot of the the what is it called the arm arm work grease something you know what yeah I mean? the leg work actually the leg work yeah, yeah the leg work. <laughs> you're wrong limb but it's okay yeah. arm work, work. <laughs> yeah. um, but but since then we've found like really amazing people to take over we've just transformed it into a 501c3 a nonprofit organization. It's going great. We have grants that we've applied for so that we can have funding for, you know, even kids who don't have instruments to, you know, purchase or purchase accessories that help them in their musical studies. And uh, it's been amazing. Like us, the student of mine who I was matched with, um, I'm great friends with him still. I kind of continue to mentor him. He just played on national public radio on a show called From the Top mm. that I'm also an alumni of. He is in the National Youth Orchestra. He's going to be touring um, Europe this summer. And uh, to see someone who is already so talented, so hardworking and dedicated uh, that they didn't have music lessons before. I came in, I kind of 
helped push them and uh, now they're having such great success. That's something very heartwarming to me. That's where that um, that passion for music accessibility to education comes in. That's really that's really amazing, Nikki. Good for you. That makes me really proud of, of you. I'm sure uh, people listening are, are really proud of you. Although this kid that you taught probably can't play Bohemian Rhapsody, can't shred on the violin the way you just did. But <laughs> But that, that, that'll come. Um, thank you so much for this. Listen, before I let you go, uh, allow yourself to be immodest and, and tell, tell us what, I mean, you still are early in your career. Is there one place or one gig or one concert hall or one event or one collaboration that is really your, your dream? If I were to say, where do you want to be 10 years from now or 15 years from now in terms of the apex of where you think you could go? What, what comes to mind? Wow. Um, you know, a dream of mine has always been to play in the Los Angeles Philharmonic, uh, or Tehrangelis, as they say. <laughs> With Dudamel? Uh, Dudamel, yep. And uh, maybe even having my own, like, private teaching studio on the side, just being involved in the community as well as performing. I love orchestral repertoire. That hall, Disney Hall, is amazing, so... All right. I, I, if anyone in Los Angeles is listening, we'll make this happen. Okay, we'll get you. <laughs> I feel like it's inevitable. Thank you so much for this. Um, it, it's been a pleasure, and uh, it's been very, you're most engaging, and I'm, uh, I'm thrilled that things are going so well for you, and we'll keep in touch. Thank you. Pleasure is all mine. Bye-bye. Bye. Nikki Naravi, an Iranian-American violinist and the co-founder of Through the Staff, an organization that provides free online music lessons to young musicians who could otherwise not afford them or have access to them. We reached Nikki Naravi in Dallas, Texas today. Phone's back on with Groovy Shia, Captain Reza, and the fabulous Keon. Well, I really enjoyed that. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. The only thing that blew my mind was the fact that her parents are still considering accounting for her as a profession. <laughs> right. Even though she's Boston Philharmonic, be <laughs> damned. <laughs> yeah. My mind. That was so funny, man. Yeah. No, oh, she said yeah. they're coming around. I know, I know. The, the, I know. the, the, the just, Dallas Noru's Festival. Yeah, and yeah. The, yeah. It's just the, the, that, that stress of like the always worrying about you, the parents. Like, it's so cute. Mm. she's um i'm amazed at uh i remember being 21 and being interviewed when i was in a band and and when somebody would go you guys are so you're so young i'd be like uh, uh, you know <laughs> oh, yeah. i remember vowing at that time like don't ever call a 21 year old young yeah. it just feels so annoying and yeah. and yet that's what i'm doing yeah, exactly yeah. now <laughs> i go oh my god she's so young <laughs> but for like I, i'm just very um impressed and mm kind of uh, heartened by how confident mm -hmm. she is and, yeah. and really has a sense of self and a yeah. sense of what she wants to do. And and just, I mean, because there are a lot of 21-year-olds who don't. That's right. uh, and so here's this young Iranian-American woman who uh, I think is a role model on a number of different levels, even beyond her yeah. violin playing. Of yeah. course, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I totally agree. And I think it's the one thing is, when you call a 21 year old young and uh, they get up, if they get upset because they think that you're calling them uh, not good enough. Like, mm -hmm. Wow, you're, you're good enough for this? Mm -hmm. That's their perception. But over the years you gain so much experience, you go through it, to you is impressive. You're giving mm -hmm. them a compliment. Mm -hmm. And after all these years, you're like, wow, you're so young to be doing some, something amazing thing. I was thinking about that when you were when you were talking, so I was daydreaming. Sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't even understand <laughs> what you good. just said. <laughs> he just he just there's no there's a lot of words and breathing, but no, there's no lever. Nice. There's no like uh, button. there's no outcome. There, there's no <laughs> tap in his brain that can be shut off when he has a thought. He just says no, it. Uh, so, I, Keon, what what I, were your thoughts about Nikki? I'm just impressed with her talent. Actually, I'm a little envious. I wish I could. 
play some instrument like piano yeah, or right? violin something i'm just so uh, like wow i bow down to her and i love the strings i love the cello the violin oh mm. have you guys been to what she was talking about the candlelight, uh, candlelight yeah, series yeah, are, yeah. no it's but incredible. i want to go you've been a bunch of times yeah right? they have them in toronto as well yeah i yeah. recommend it you guys should yeah, i think she's doing that in boston it's a it, but right it's yeah it sounds awesome i've not been to yeah, one oh, of those and no. it's Amazing. such a good idea and a way to bring like a young crowd Interest into, into yeah. Yeah. What, what, can I just ask, what, what would Reza wear if he went to one of those <laughs> no at this time I gotta now. dress up yeah. I think yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> ask she's your mother right. but she's right it's a way to get the young people interested in classical music like one of the events was called uh, Bach to Beatles mm. so they would play Bach as well as Beatles music mm. and that's a way to like you wow, know peak interest in so cool. people that necessarily I think that's a great idea I have to say I mean as impressive as she is playing her first of all the um the the Bijana Mortazavi. Oh, I mean that's that, that I that's uh, I was it was kind of <laughs> hilarious. I mean I can't, I, you know. But I was gonna I was just gonna say the part that I mean you could hear me reacting there yeah. when she just played uh, Bohemian, Bohemian Rhapsody, Rhapsody yeah. and she at first she's playing the the singing part, yes. you know, mama, you know, and then she starts shredding. She starts doing yeah, the the, yeah, the yeah. Brian May guitar <laughs> solo, and I just thought, wow, yeah. this mm. kid is yeah. this is a bit, and the fact that she's not really practicing that yeah. can just do it do, do it with her ear wow. you know it's just really really fun really yeah impressive. i'm really curious to see how she plays Bijan or because it's very scary <laughs> and Super. i don't know how she can because we've talked about this like if you're a western kid you have problem with care yes, yes, yes. but i'm curious how she plays the Bijan i was kind of hoping you would ask her to play Bijan Mortazavi, i know i should have you know? i should have <laughs> she threw it out there and yeah. i didn't i didn't close Shame. the deal on that yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, anyway, thank you to Nikki Naravi. And if you don't um, follow her, do check her out on Instagram where you can see her. And, and again, as we just talked about in the interview, she, there's 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 so much of what she posts that is self-effacing. And you know, here's me making a mistake. And here's mm. um, it, it feels very refreshingly authentic and good for her. It's uh, great to be able to introduce her to some folks around the world if you didn't already know about Nikki Naravi. I know we've got letters coming up. We've got the Oshi Arezu yeah. project uh, we're going to talk about coming up. But first, let, let me get to our, our next guest because I know she's waiting. Is an Iranian-American entrepreneur and creative who has created something of an important nexus for the global Iranian community. Golshid Mola is the founder and director of an exchange marketplace called Alangu. Alangu is a New York-based online platform that creates a connection between designers and consumers who want to buy their products. Alangu has focused its mission on supporting independent artists and designers from Iran and the Middle East by giving them a platform they previously didn't have to showcase and sell their works globally. So who is the inventive guru behind this popular and transformative platform? Well, Golshid was born and raised in Tehran. She moved to the U.S. in the early 2000s to continue her education and build her career, received her master's in graphic communications management and technology technology from New York University. In 2013, she launched Alangu, and now she's also hosting a major fashion show in Los Angeles in the next couple of weeks, which we will get to. But first, Golshid Mola joins me from Los Angeles today. Hello. Hi, Gian John. Thank you for having me. Very nice to have you on the program. I thought you were a, a hipster New York design and tech star. What are you doing? In, now you've become an LA Persian now? I'm, well, I'm I'm a forever New Yorker. New York is home, and I never consider myself an Angelino, but I live in LA now, and it's not that bad. It's not that bad. It's no, not New York, but it's not that bad. Good kebab in LA. You can find good kebab. That's one major thing about LA. Yes, you get kebab <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> when did you? Um, let me jump in and ask you about your platform first. When did you first have this idea? for a platform that would allow essentially indie designers from Iran, from the Middle East, to find clients around the world? So, um, Jian, I have to actually make this clear, because when you say Iranian designers, and you know, Alang is an American company, so we have a lot of issues with the sanctions. So when we say Iranian, we mean Iranian origin. Hmm. Uh, we don't mean that we bring products from Iran. Right. So that's less, right. uh, I have to make that clear sure. because of the sanctions. But yes, we do showcase, you know, designers with unique cultural backgrounds. And the main focus is on, our, is on you know, designers with Iranian background, obviously, because I'm Iranian. Uh, but now we're trying to you know, expand it to other cultures as well. So 
Uh, because I used to be a designer myself back in Iran. I, I went to, you know, I, I studied art and, um, you know, we became like a huge community. Not a huge community, but, you know, a group of friends. And uh, we used to design and we used to like do a lot of, um, I can say some some of them underground events, uh, you know, presenting and selling our handmade items. And then I left Iran and moved to New York. And, you know, whenever I would go back to Iran, I would see that, you know, these designers are like just amazing. They would get amazing day by day, you know, more professional. And um, I just felt like a disconnect. There was a disconnect. Nobody really knew about them. And uh, I really thought that, you know, we needed something like that for the Iranian diaspora to actually get exposed to the designs that is uh, that are happening within the immigrant community or in Iran. At that point, I was hoping that, you know, the sanctions will go away, away but they never did, unfortunately. But I'm still waiting for that. Hmm. So, I mean, for people who, um, I'm actually surprised at just mentioning to, to, to some folks anecdotally that you're coming on the program. A lot of people are aware of Alangu. For people who aren't, who haven't used the site, haven't seen it, um, and are unfamiliar with it, what's your elevator pitch? How can you, can you explain very quickly what Alangu is? Well, Alangu is an Etsy-like marketplace uh, that is curated and showcases designers with unique cultural backgrounds. That's the pitch. That's perfect. And so people, <laughs> like, you've obviously done this before. You, you did an elevator pitch probably. So, so, so what do people do? They go to this site, they find things that they like, and they can just uh, buy them, and, and, and they have a direct connection to the designer? Exactly. So um, we have two types of uh, clients. We have sellers and we have shoppers. So for sellers, they have to submit an application. They go through like a uh, screening process so that we approve the applications. They, you know, we look at the items, the designs. And after they get approved, then they have access to their shops within alangu.com. They also have an inbox uh, that they can communicate with, um, you know, with their uh, shoppers. And then we have shoppers who come to um, alangu.com. They, they can look around, browse the website. And they can shop uh, from various designers that are that do have a shop with Alangu. And then every time there's a purchase made, the designer gets an email, including the item and the and the shopper's information, so that they ship, uh, so that they can ship uh, the item to the shoppers. Okay, um, well done. I'm trying. My mind is trying to catch up with you because you speak. Have you, has anyone ever told you you speak very quickly? Uh, yes, all the time. Maybe that's the way to, you know, to hide the accent. Maybe that's why. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's why you're a tech star. You're ahead of the rest of us. It's goes. Um, th there's a there's a real emphasis on the global immigrant community with Alangu. Why why has it been particularly important for you to place that emphasis on on a on a what would otherwise be seemingly an agnostic platform? Well, our community is really important to me, the Iranian community. And, you know, we're growing um, by minutes. I mean, people are leaving Iran every day, thousands of people. And our, our diaspora is becoming really big all over the world. And this diaspora is really important to me. As challenging as we are, um, I want to stay connected and I want to like offer something, a service, big or small, I don't care. I just want to do something for the community. And it's very important for me. Well, my field is creative so that's the way that i you know try to present the culture try to promote the culture try to like, offer a service for the community i mean it's you, just important you you said you're a real new yorker but you're also a a real iruni you if i have yeah. this correct you were born in tehran on the day the islamic republic was formed is that is that right Yes, I'm born in Dahe Faj. Yes. Uh huh. Um, <laughs> it's quite a distinction. It is. Well, they used to give me presents every year right. in school. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and, and what was it like growing up for you in Iran during that time, during the Iran Iraq War? It was really scary. Really scary. Like the worst memory of my life. I used to hide with my grandfather. My grandfather used to be a general for Shah. Oh. When I was born in Dahe Faj, obviously he was hiding. Um, and, you know, growing up for me was like hiding in the basement, basically, with my grandfather. Because first he was hi hiding from the Islamic regime, and then we had to hide because uh, of the bombardment. So that's how I grew up. That's a pretty um, traumatic sounding yeah. uh, period in the yeah. early years. Were you an artistic kid? I was always. Hmm. So, so it wouldn't surprise folks who knew you, family, etc., that you've ended up creating the kind of platform you have. 
Now, they really pushed me to become a doctor, obviously, <laughs> but it didn't work. But they always knew that I was a creative, always. I used to draw like paintings on the walls. Even when I was like an adult, as an adult, I would still do it. And the fashion piece too, were you really into that? Always. And your your parents are not artists, are they? They're not, but they just they support. They um, they like art. You know, we're not a type of family. My fa- my parents, my dad is a surgeon. My mom is a lawyer. So I'm not an I, I'm not from an artistic family at all. But um, but I'm from a family that values art. You know, they value art and creativity. That's nice to hear. Yeah. Um, but so you get a bachelor's degree at Azad University. I mean, you've mm-hmm. said that thereafter, you you were part of. A, I guess this would be in the late nineties, early two thousand. You're part of a real artistic community in Tehran, um, and kind of a fertile one at that time. Why why did you end up leaving at all? Um, honestly, um, because I wanted to you know as an, as a, like a twenty something year old uh, in my early twenties, I wanted to explore. I wanted to see what's happening in, in outside Iran. But I never actually left Iran with an intention that I was not going back. I always wanted wanted to go back, so I wanted to you know continue my education and explore a little and go back to Iran. But then um, that never happened because uh, actually the reason that I didn't go back is because I met my husband in New York. Oh. yeah. If it wasn't for him, I would definitely most probably go back. Is he non Iranian? He is Iranian, but he's raised in California, and uh, we met in New York. He was doing his residency in New York. We met at a bar, actually. We met at Buddha Bar, <laughs> and oh. um, and I just stayed um, because he, he could never live in Iran. He, he wouldn't speak Persian that well at that time. Right now, he does, uh, and you know there was no future for him in Iran, so mm. I stayed. So he was doing his residency. So I'm guessing he's a doctor. Yes. So you didn't become a doctor, but you you married a doctor. You know, not. You know, I, I grew up in that type of a family. <laughs> you, know. <laughs> when, you know, you've also said, though, that, I mean, I guess this is before the fateful night at the Buddha Bar. You, you've said that when you first ended up in New York, uh, you suffered a real loss of confidence. Um, you end up working in a brokerage firm, which seems like a strange mm-hmm. place, knowing you yeah. now, that for you to be working. Tell me about that time. Yeah, super strange. When I moved to New York, um, I was alone. Uh, I didn't know anybody. Um, I could move to LA when I had a lot of family, but I didn't. Um, uh, so I, it was it was difficult for me to build that, you know that community of friends that I can relate to. It was very challenging. I can say it took me like ten years to actually find people that I could actually feel that they are my good friends. Mm. Um, and I started in um, in Wall Street. That my first job, at real job, was in Wall Street, um, and. Um, it was not relevant to my background at all, but it was an amazing experience. I mean, as a girl, I was 21, um, like with an art background, working at a brokerage firm, like such an intense environment. It was really amazing, but it wasn't for me, obviously. Um, I lost my confidence in art because New York is very famous for art. And I always thought that they're the most amazing artists in, are in New York. And what do I say? What do I do? You know, I just studied art in Iran. Um, so I kind of stayed away from it. What did you learn um, working at a brokerage firm? You said it was really good learning experience. What did you learn? Yeah, well, I sensed the real New York. I mean, New York is Wall Street. I, New York is like a couple of things. this advertisement, Wall Street, and fashion. Mm. Uh, and I experienced all of that. I, was, I feel so lucky to have experienced all of that. I started from uh, finance and um, Wall Street, and then I was in media. I, I worked at the largest media company in, in the world that's headquartered in New York. And then which, I which one is that? Time Warner? What? Which? What's the largest? No, company? it was uh, it was a WPP company, okay. Mindshare. Uh, WPP is the, it used to be. I, I think still is the largest uh, media advertisement company. Oh, okay, okay. Well, y- you know, it, one thing that does occur to me is that. Uh, as creative a platform as Alangu is in terms of w- where its heart is, uh, it's a business. It's a platform that you. I mean, so I, I would imagine that. I don't even know how creative you get to be as as the president of Alangu. You you're basically running a, a business, so that mm-hmm. that brokerage uh, experience probably helped in some way too, right? Um, not the brokerage experience, but um, but um, I was in Boston for a couple of years, and in Boston, um, I make friends with um, some of the um, because Boston is like a 
Silicon Valley of the East Coast. Mm. You know, there's like entrepreneurial environment there. There's like Harvard Business School and several other amazing business schools. So I met my friend Farnaz, if she listens to this. Um, she pushed me. She was doing her MBA then, and then she made, she connected me to other, um, you know, like-minded people. And I got involved in that community. And I would take courses, seminars, conferences to just become familiar with the business side of it. And then um, I met. There was this website, Karma Loop. I'm not sure if you know them. They used to be one of the largest fashion e-commerces mm. in the U.S. And their headquarter was also in Boston. And I met with the CEO, founder and CEO. He loved my mission and he welcomed me into his uh, building, like 10 floor of like just fashion e-commerce. So again, I was lucky. I, I love when people end up um, either with intent or um, mm -hmm. through a happy accident doing something that seems so perfect for them. So, I mean, you, you end up doing a master's at NYU in graphics, communication management and technology. Um, you're this creative person and who loves art and design. Uh, and who's been involved in that. It's almost like Alangu is the perfect baby born from your talents, you know, tech innovation, creativity. That said, you it doesn't necessarily follow that it was going to work. Did you always have a, a quiet confidence that this, this platform was going to work? No, I knew it was a great idea, but I didn't know that I was able to actually pull it off. Uh, honestly, but I really worked hard, Gian. I mean, you know, when you talk about it, it's easy. It sounds easy. Like if I say, oh, I was lucky I met Carmelo. I was lucky, but it, it wasn't luck. I was after it. I would set up meetings with everybody. I was not shy about that. I would ask people to do something for me or to help me. So um, I think I was, uh, the reason that Alangu became Alangu is because I was very persistent. Hmm. I wouldn't just give up. That's the man. And every time I know I speak at panels and, you know, I, uh, I sometimes talk to younger generation. That's that's my only advice. Just be persistent. Don't give up and it will work out. Somehow it will work out. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times w when we have really successful people um, on this program, uh, especially in, in business, some of the people who've done been involved in startups, they talk about this, the perseverance. In other words, there would have been moments early on the first couple of years or whatever, where you think, how is this possibly going to continue? Would that be true? Yep, definitely. Yeah. And um, another thing is that um, a, a lot of people started similar concept after Alangu, but they just gave up because, you know, they, they think that this is something that you start making money super quickly. Mm. They're not patient enough to just wait until it gets there. They saw Alangu and they're like, okay, so I'm, I'm going to build a platform. I'm going to start mm. making you know, loads of money. And then it didn't happen and they let go so again it worked out to my benefit because i was persistent and i stayed well you also created a blueprint of sorts i mean alan Gu was the first maybe still is the only company of its of its kind based on showcasing designs and works of iranian uh people of iranian background artists of iranian background um i'm curious what the challenges were in building up this platform in the first years how is the iranian community i mean i could list the ways but how would you list the ways the iranian community is challenging for you i mean we are a difficult crowd <laughs> it's not easy to deal with iranians especially when they work with another iranian i have a feeling that if they when they work with like white community they're like they have a completely different attitude all of a sudden they're understanding and patient and kind but when they work with an iranian all of that changes you know that's i don't know why is that we have to change that. so can I you can can you think of an example of that i mean think of give me an example of how this this has been challenging especially i mean now you're established i would imagine it's probably easier but in the in the beginning how was that challenging dealing with the community to be honest with you, um, it wasn't as challenging. To be honest, it was I, I was expecting way more difficulties working with Iranians, but it was like a normal amount of challenges because I was ready for it. I was like, okay, they're gonna kill me. So that was my attitude, but then they didn't kill me. So that's why I don't think we are actually that bad, but we're difficult. Examples are so many examples. Like, first of all, as, as soon as they think like this is an Iranian run, business mm -hmm. they automatically assume that the customer service is really bad <laughs> and the first thing that they say like they started like chat like they ask a question we answer them but for example we don't start with hi how are you how, how's your day that's not the culture of alangu i don't want that i don't allow that my, uh -huh. i tell my team 
chatting is not about like creating small talk. So get to the point of the question, answer the question, and done. Wow. Uh, I think maybe American, like North America, is also kind of spoiled when it comes to customer service and Iranian shoppers. They expect that and they get really offended. Like one time, this person emailed me and said, "Your customer service is very rude. They behaved in a way that." like i was their friend i'm not their friend and i was like so you're upset because we were friendly why what did bother you exactly and i looked at the chat and there was no hi how are you uh there was like thank you for your question this is your answer and then they push it they want to they don't want to do the job for example they don't want to go and track that order themselves they want to actually text us and ask us to track for them mm. because she's lazy she doesn't want to do it herself and um i get kind of annoyed and i don't do it i'm like this is the email please track your order and they don't like it i think maybe it's my fault maybe i we should actually be accommodating to them but um you know they're like small things like that and they 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 start with like oh of course this is an iranian run that's why you're so unprofessional like to, <laughs> that's like a start of the chat mm. we haven't even been like any like professional or unprofessional that's the start of the chat well, it's so funny that you should talk about the the small talk because on the one hand, I mean, somebody just listening to this randomly would think, well, what's wrong with being polite and friendly? But you're quite right that so much of that so often is is kind of bullshit talk, right? I mean, it's like the قابل نادر خوش بکن. I mean, you're just like, what, 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 what place does that have on an online chat, right? Another example, actually, it's funny also. One of the influencers in Orange County um, – Send them, uh, send me this link to the product, and she said, uh, "I want this product, but please, please, no discount, no discount. Just, I just want to pay full amount. Please promise that you don't give me any discount because I used to give her a discount." And I'm like, "Sure, I don't want to make you uncomfortable, of course." So I sent her the link. The product was $250. I sent her the link. I said, "You know, this is the link." Um, she blocked me. <laughs> the next day, I was blocked. I was like, Oh my god. Because there was no Just discount? Like, <laughs> how much? Like, it's all Toro. Like, you specifically asked me not to provide a discount with you. I didn't want to make you uncomfortable. Wow. So I sent you the actual link and you blocked me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that the stereotype would be that, uh, because we've talked about this on the show in different ways before and I of course we don't want to throw all Persians under the bus because but but that that to a certain extent for Iranians dealing with Iranians there is some expectation that there's gonna be yeah. some kind of deal that um, because some back Iranian herself. like they don't expect that from a non-Iranian correct yeah that's right if you're an American site that isn't run by an Iranian full price <laughs> but exactly. uh, yeah so that's a that's a tough thing to navigate when you're um, particularly interested in dealing with Iranian designs and stuff right yeah but actually uh, to answer your question about the challenges it's more challenging for me as an Iranian person born and raised in Iran to actually um, present my culture and fashionable items with a touch of Iranian culture to Americans and actually make them realize that this is actually cool. This is mm. trendy. You know, they're not really open to that. And my goal ultimately is to make Western audiences become interested in the in Persian inspired designs, not just Iranians. And that is actually the most challenging part mm. because they just don't get it. They're not into it. So I'm, we're, we're creating that culture here. It, I feel, but isn't it becoming sort of a trend, the Eastern? Exactly. Yeah. So um, we are trying to do that. We are trying, actually, um, Alang is relaunching. We are um, having a new team, new management, new everything, because we're going to operate as like a legit, legit startup. And, um, and the mission is that our tagline right now is culture made fashionable. This is the tagline of mm. the, com the new company. And our debut event, um, the fashion show, actually, this is the whole focus of our mission is to how to make culture fashionable. Mm. And uh, luckily, yes, it is uh, becoming a trend. Uh, the trendsetters are into um, you know authentic design, so it's a good time to promote Persian culture. Sorry, what, what do you mean you're becoming a legit startup? Aren't you already a legit startup? Um, no, again, yeah, no, because um, I've never had that business plan. I mean, it's not easy to pitch to investors when you don't have a business background. Mm. You're just a creative person. You don't have a tech partner. You don't have a 
a partner with MBA. So nobody invests in a company like this. Mm. Uh, and um, right now I have um, I have a partner, uh, we have a tech partner, we have, you know, we're, we're, we're like a whole team right now. I'm still founder and the president of the company, but uh, right now our team is complete. And um, our debut event, which is an amazing fashion show on June 12th in Los Angeles, you know, the event is for the new company that's going to launch exactly uh, the next day. Let me get to the event. I'm going to ask you about it before I let you go. But just just before we get there, uh, mm-hmm. I know there's different tiers to Alangu and different price points. Mm-hmm. You have the Alangu Bazaar and you have the boutique and then you have Alangu Looks. What is the most popular? What are people coming to this platform for? Is it generally the high-end stuff or is it the, I guess it's the Bazaar that's the more accessibly priced stuff? Um, it's different. People who visit Bazaar is mainly to buy gifts for other, for friends and family. So um, I can say most of the most of the shoppers um, buy gifts from Bazaar. And if you, if they visit boutique, because boutique has a higher price point than Bazaar, Bazaar is more affordable and is more mainstream. Boutique is more artistic uh, and more expensive. Um, so people who go to boutique normally shop for themselves. They want to buy something unique with a touch of culture. They go to boutique, uh, but uh, I think both of them are equally successful, honestly. But that, but the audience is very different. Okay, so um, give us your. Um, is the fashion show on June twelfth in LA? It's open to the public, right? People can go. It is. It is open to public, but it's ticketed. It's a ticketed event. Okay, so for all the folks who are listening in Southern California right now, um, t- tell us what they can expect and why they should come on June twelfth. Jian Jun, this is nobody has ever something something like this before. This is the first time that an American company is focusing on Iranian designers in an international fashion show. Uh, we are presenting six designers. Um, four of them are Iranian, coming from all over the world. One of them is one of the major male designers in Istanbul. He uh, he's presenting a male collection coming all over from Istanbul. There is uh, an amazing Indian fashion designer who's coming from India, super trendy, again, with a touch of culture. After after LA, after our fashion show, she's going to Paris and Milan uh, fashion show. So she is a major right now. And I'm so thankful for them to trust us and coming all the way from India and Istanbul. And the rest of the designers are Iranian origin, from Iranian origin, and they're coming from London and Toronto. And I'm also presenting a new collection by Alangu.com. It's uh, designed uh, by Hamoun for Alangu. That's uh, that's going to be a really fun collection. And uh, nobody has ever uh, done this. I, I don't think even in Europe, you know, a fashion show with such mission was never done. You know, there are like fashion shows in Dubai that pres- that, that they have like one Iranian designer. But the goal of the fashion show is never like to feature designers only with unique cultural backgrounds. And uh, I really expect the community to support this event because it's worth it. What's the date? Uh, it's on June 12th. June 12th. And, and where is it? It's on a prime location in Fashion District in downtown LA. It's a brand new building, the largest rooftop of the West Coast. Okay. What, what, did, can you say the name of the building? So people, where is it? Yeah. It's 1027 Wilshire Boulevard. All right. All right. We call it 1020. We call it, they call it 1027 Wilshire. It's a Sunday. I think people from um, all over the world should descend upon LA to go to come to this mesmerizing uh, fashion show. Listen, congratulations on all that you've done with um, Alan Goose so far. I'm um, looking forward to your the way you're scaling it the, to the next level and your big fashion show. And it's a it's a pleasure getting to talk to you. Thanks for doing this, Koshid. Thank you, Jean Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure talking to you as well. Thank you again so much. Good office. Good office. Good office. Golshid Mola, uh, an Iranian-American entrepreneur and creative and the founder and director of an exchange marketplace called Alangu. So if you are in the Los Angeles area, Alangu will be hosting their first major fashion show, uh, I guess, next week, at the end of this week, June 12th, this Sunday coming up. You can get tickets at alangu.com. And if you use the promo code ROQUE, R-O-Q-E, you will get 20% off your ticket. Use the promo code ROOK at alangu.com to go to that fashion show in LA on June 12th. Goshid Mola joined us from Los Angeles, California today.
microphone's back on for the fabulous Keon, Groovy Shia, and uh, Captain Reza. Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Captain. Uh, so, uh, first of all, um, it's too bad we can't all go to L.A. I know, this weekend. I was just going to say. Um, it's a shame. So, this uh, June 12th, once again, promo code ROOK. If you go to their website, alangu.com. Uh, good for Gold Sheet. The story of building this thing, uh, it feels like it's its more commonplace now to have these mm-hmm. exchange marketplaces. But uh, as I've been telling people that Gold Sheet was going to come on the show, uh, there's so much awareness around Alangu because I think it was the first or one of the, you know, leading the way, pioneering this idea for Iranian designers. And, and it seems like it really has its heart in the right place. Yeah, I, I didn't know Gold Sheet, but Alangu is a very, I think it's the place that you when you want to buy something some gift and mm. alangu is the place that you go usually so it's very famous yeah. Did you know? it's like etsy for persian yes for persian. i yes. had no idea this is new for me i'm, I'm gonna check it out yeah, yeah i'm always looking for unique gifts and stuff and i just never yes well there's I go a, to etsy usually there, there's a prime uh, uh, there's there's a real focus put on independent artists mm. and and artists from the middle east and designers and you know so i think it's 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 a good it's, it's a good a thing good to thing. do. I mean, mm-hmm. a good business for Gold Sheet in the meantime, but mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. you want to say something, Reza? No. Maybe you can find no. something to wear to the Ali Azibi concert. <laughs> I should start saying less, less and less. <laughs> <laughs> it's taken you 35 years to figure that out. But, yeah, only. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, listen, I want to get, I know we've got letters coming up, but before we do that, we've got a special guest who's walked in the studio, and I want to introduce a member of, I would say, the Toronto Iranian community who's doing something novel and something interesting, Fatty Bob. Fad is a professional family mediator and counselor who also has a mission and her mission is to bring positivity Uh, and she's doing that in this case with Osh. This is the tasty stew that is a staple of Persian cuisine and specifically a project called Oshe Arezu which translates to uh, the the, the wish of the, the, the Osh wish. Right. Uh, so first of all, welcome, Fadi Bajan. Thank you so much for having me today here. I feel very special. Thank well, you. Aww. We feel this. <laughs> thank you for visiting us. And I, I should say I know of this project because I was one of the recipients oh, of some yeah. Asha Arzu last year. And so first of all, tell us, uh, I know there's some history to this idea. So briefly tell us where this idea comes from. I don't know how much time do I have to share the story. I was a student in Tabriz University and I was invited to a wedding. Uh, me and m- a few of my friends, we attend the wedding and uh, the morning after we woke up and we saw a big, big pot in the middle of the uh, village. And then I asked my friend, what is going on? She said, oh, we're preparing Asha Arazua. And I had never heard of it. I said, what is that? And she explained that each um, neighbor mm-hmm. brings an item to put into this stew. So someone brings lubia, someone brings nohod, like beans and um, everything else, rice and meat. And we put it in the pot and then we stir it. And a giant pot. A, a giant big, pot, uh-huh. like for... 500 people (laughs) so uh, they prepare it and it takes usually at least 20 hours Mm. uh, for it to be um, exactly like Mm. well done settled yes yes and um, I love the idea and I thought oh so you you're gathering here to eat us she said no the um, idea is if you bring your wish here and you wish for something from inside from your bottom of your heart Mm. it's gonna happen i said how she said (laughs) just watch so for me it was really a moment that i thought about it oh my god why didn't i think about this before and um so wait a second the person when you bring something to to the osh to Mm -hmm. the big uh, pot dig, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm, it, it, mm-hmm. is that when you give your wish, or do you, you receive a wish when you receive the ash? Yeah, it's, it's like blowing the candle inside your head. Uh-huh. You have a wish, you blow the candle. The process is to bring that item, like the nochot. Uh, you wish for something, and you take it to the pot, and you uh-huh. s- help them stir, uh-huh. and. Um, 
surprisingly, I mean, um, I don't know how much people are into uh, spiritual um, topics, but your wish comes true because you put the energy, you put the um, positiveness into hmm. that. And um, a few years ago here, my friend called me and she said, Oh my God, my mom was diagnosed with um, cancer and she was crying. And I didn't know what, being a family therapist, I still didn't find a good response. Yeah. So immediately I said, do you want me to help you make Asha Arazua? And immediately without knowing, she said, yes. Hmm. I said, okay, let's plan this. And to be honest, we planned and her mom attended uh, um, Asha Arazua. A week later, she called me and she said, a mojaze happened, a miracle happened, and uh, they misdiagnosed my mom, so there's no cancer. Mm. Yeah. It was just, uh, so even uh, talking about it, I'm getting goosebumps, but um, a lot of people came, not even 100% believing on what it is, mm -hmm. but later on they called and they said, oh, I wish for such and such, and it happened, I got my wish. So that's how the process got I bigger see. and bigger. The but even without the wish part, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a lovely project because basically, who get, explain who gets this Osh. You, okay. What do you do in terms of distributing it? So then? what we did, I made it North American style because I knew no one would be willing to commit 20 hours to come and stir the Osh. <laughs> right. So I said, what you would do, you prepare the item that you choose at your own kitchen mm -hmm. and uh, make sure to put your own favorite spice and prepare it the, wa the way you want it. When it's prepared, they bring it, and they mm, usually it's in my garage. You add so it to the... So we have a big pot, mm -hmm. and we put everything inside, and we stir it. It takes at least like two, three hours. But in Tabriz, when you, the first time you saw this, mm -hmm. was it in Tabriz? Yeah. Or you, you, it you was, got, no... Um, it was in a vigil, village Ma near yeah, Tabriz, Yeah, right? it was uh, Maku. Okay. Yeah. It, w w this big pot that they have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So once the ash is made... Mm -hmm. Or, does it, or they just keep making the ash. I mean, ha they uh, make the ash uh -huh. and then they let it settle for like half an hour, forty-five minutes. Yeah. They put it inside the bowls or dishes yeah. that people have brought, and then they take it. This is something that like everyone, neighbors, community people everyone, come by. Everybody everyone, comes in. Yeah, everyone who has some wish, but the bed. The best way is to participate. Some people think that oh, if. Um, just I uh, have a spoon of this ash, my wish is going to come through. But <laughs> right, right. it's all inside your head that how much you're willing to put inside that project to make it happen. Now, what if somebody, I have uh, too many questions already. What if somebody brings an ingredient that you don't think is a good idea for the ash? No, we usually like write I want to put some oranges in the ash okay. or something. So we usually have uh, a group all the people who want to participate, mm. they reply. I see. When they respond, we have um, a list that these are the list. Like some people brought a lot of cash to this, um, which was not even necessary. Mm -hmm. But we said next time we would just put the list and you choose you pick from which the one. list. I see. Yeah. I see. So it's not. And, and I think you told me something about how. When you were doing this in your garage last year or a couple mm -hmm. of years ago, though, as you've been doing this now as a yearly kind of event, mm -hmm. um, there were non-Iranians who were asking you what's what's happening, and then they really got into it as well, right? Uh, I believe that there is a very, very huge positive energy into this project that mm. people would just pass by going down the ravine, down the road, and they would just stop by and say, what's going on in here? And usually they wouldn't. Like we would have, uh, I don't know, anything going on in our driveway. No one would stop and ask us what's happening. This particular day, everyone was interested. Mm. What's going on? I love it. I feel the energy. So we had to give them some ash, of, of course. And they asked us, if you ever have this project again, we want to participate. Mm. So during the corona and all those lockdowns, we did the project in private, like three of my friends in my garage. We um, did the project, but we wanted to avoid the crowd. Mm. This year, we're hoping that we would do it as many 
uh, people as possible. And, and one of the reasons why I wanted you to come on the show is because um, we, we've talked about the idea of this. This doesn't just happen have to happen in uh, north part of Toronto. No. This can happen all over the world. I mean, people, it's such a lovely idea. So to me, the idea of people creating this these, these mm-hmm. magical pots of Osh mm-hmm. um, in Sydney, Australia, in San Diego, in Berlin, uh, in uh, Dubai, wherever they're listening to us, um, it is and, and maybe even all on the same day on the first day of summer is a lovely okay. idea in fact I want to encourage people everyone just uh, bring your positive energy and try to start your own project mm-hmm. wherever you live in Vienna and uh, Paris wherever you are start your project and in fact I want to um, give a very short quick example in the anniversary of 9-1-1, like 9-11, mm-hmm. in New York, tell me, what was the lottery ticket who that won the number? Do you know what was the number? No. 9-1-1. Why? I don't know. Because everybody was thinking about 9-11. Everybody was thinking. Okay, this was part the freaks me out a little bit. I don't no, know how no, I feel no, about this part. It's true. Google it. <laughs> okay, Google it, yeah. Okay. So I'm just thinking if everyone, all the crowd, thinks mm-hmm. about something, most likely it's going to happen. Well, let me ask you about, okay. uh, you know, when you, because it, one thing that does come up on this program is when we're talking about the Iranian community and, and um, the situation for Iranians, uh, obviously in Iran, but even ar- around the world, oftentimes we're talking about difficult subjects. We're talking mm-hmm. about dark uh, events. We're talking about sad things. Um, you, you are a counselor. You, mm-hmm. you work with families. Obviously, you've had to deal with a lot of this kind of um, uh, difficult subject matter. Tell me about this commitment to positivity, What okay. where that comes in, from in you as a therapist. Um, I usually prefer not to talk about this sad part, but I have to tell you, I apologize in advance, but a few people that I knew, um, they decided to kill themselves, like people who I would see every day at my um, husband's dealership. Mm. There was a gentleman who would come and clean the floors and wash the kitchen and everything. One day, Monday morning, I go in and I see Javid is not there. I say, oh, what happened to Javid? They said, we don't know. And on my way, I heard on the news says the 404 um, is closed because of emergency. Mm. And it always worries me. And later on, I noticed that poor guy ended his life because he had depression. And I blame myself that how did I not notice that he has depression? I would see him in front of me every single day. So that was the first one. And then um, a kid from my daughter's school decided to end his life because he thought that um, no one cares about him. Mm. Or These happened. And then I decided that I want to make I want to start a project that makes people happy. Mm. Give them a choice that there is a way out of this. And me doing the family therapy for many years, even I was vulnerable. I was always felt down. Oh, my God, I want to feel depressed. But I encourage myself that to start a project to encourage other people that there is other ways. Mm. So I started um, gathering people. Let's walk. Like, let's walk together. I don't want to walk alone. And then this started as a walk, and then we named it Jim Berry. But the mm. feeling is to encourage the gym going feeling. Mm. Not just, it's not like that everyone would just go to the gym when right, they right. join our club. It's just the happy feeling that we want to encourage. And um, there are different projects into this. Um, I don't want to take too no, much. No, this of is time. great. I mean, I really appreciate everything you've just said. That 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 gives a real insight into where it's coming from in you, and um, and it, I I really think it's a lovely idea, and I think people should 
take this up uh, around the world and 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 why not i mean start small a few people making an osh together and 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 sharing it and sharing their wishes as well is mm -hmm. it's such a a beautiful thought although i do want you to figure out a way to regulate the consumption of osh for people mm -hmm. like me so that i don't get too chalk with all the osh that i want to eat when i see a giant pot of it true i am um, we have been using thank you for taking that for question seriously no no no, 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 like, no not about yes that. actually Sian, you look like you've eaten too much osh no, 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 yes. true yes, yes true you. looking at you thank you look you like much. you're bloated oh my from God, osh you look amazing, how can i we're oh, yeah. all trying to as keep a therapist our diet, but no 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 Should i leave i feel like i'm interrupting a private session a lot of people who are vegetarian, they said that they really want to participate in this project, mm. but they don't want to have any meat. So mm. we put two pots last mm. time, for one for vegetarian and one. And then this year I decided, you know what, why even bother with the meat part? And oh. uh, we are skipping the meat, which wow. is really okay. low calorie, healthy, yummy. Ash, so mm. there it doesn't you make go. a difference when Gian eats like <laughs> five bowls of it. No, Maybe we'll just limit the intake per person. <laughs> Gian, you're cut off, man. Uh, uh, <laughs> he starts that, disguising this himself. Is with not, hands. It's not um, wrong to not put meat in the Osh. I mean, isn't that part of the. Uh, I guess that you can make meatless osh. Yes. Yeah. People yeah. are happy with that. Um, so, okay, let me bring the gang in here. Do you, yes. do you have any thoughts, questions about Osh? Yeah, I have a Shaya, question. Yes. So uh, what's the different, the main difference between Ashe Arazu and Ashe Nazri, which okay. we have? Oh, what, how do you, so can you uh, translate Ashe Nazri? Ashe Nazri is like a you religious background. Oh. Okay, so the difference is a lot of people actually ask me, oh, is this Nazri? I said, no, I get really offended that this has no roots to religion because this if you Google, has a root in our country before Islam was oh. entered. So, um, oh, really? Asha so Arazu is, is a yeah, thing that's been it's this. something that in old, old ancient days, yeah. when they wanted something to happen, mm -hmm. they would all gather. Mm. I guess they were smarter than us. Yeah, it sounds like it. <laughs> they would gather and they would wish and mm -hmm. they would make it happen. And this is one of the ways. Do you know how old this tradition dates back to? Like it says very, very like uh, thousands of two thousand. Wow. So um, I'm just um, presenting this case on behalf of them that mm -hmm. they thought about this, that they uh, they can gather everyone's positive energy. So mm -hmm. Ashin Azri is you, um, you make a deal with God or with mm. uh, your religion. Mm -hmm. Okay, if my daughter gets into University of Toronto, I would feed 100 people Ash. That's a deal. Mm -hmm. In this one, there's no deal. Mm. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah thank um, you. Thank you, Shia, for your uh, question about religion. And uh, <laughs> like a town hall all no, of a sudden. Okay, yeah. if, if you say somebody, I would say, uh -huh. oh, yeah, 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 I associated no. it with the same thing. I was like, oh, isn't that a thi like a religious yeah, thing? Yeah, I thought that was a yeah, thing, so I'm too. I'm glad you Yeah, but I'm glad you crowdfunded. I want to make it happen so many times that this would has have uh, its own place in our community yeah. no one would think that this is ocean as and is it done on the summer equinox every yeah. year is that and yeah. it, it has to be done during that time we do it that date but we also like during Corona, mm -hmm. a lot of requests, the texts and mm -hmm. messages, please, please make Asha Arizwa, and I made it. Yeah. But um, this is the specific date, and mm -hmm. I want to um, make sure people get encouraged by this project and make it in their own it's city. A beautiful concept. Yeah. I had never heard of this, so okay. I'm, I'm so happy that you're sharing with our, our audience. Our culture right now. is yeah. so rich that and if we, have we no dig idea. in, <laughs> we would find really really cool stuff yeah. so so uh this is a perhaps a naive question but who who starts the osh like if somebody wants to do this in you know they're listening in london right now and okay. they want to does one person just start making osh and then invite basically, others to come and basically someone who actually is not afraid of doing um um, the host being the host mm. and also doing a lot of uh, extra work right. but it's all fun 
Mm -hmm. uh, you love it when people reach out to you and say, oh, my God, I had applied for my brother's visa like 10 times and it was mm -hmm. rejected as soon as I attended this. Asha as well. No, he got the visa. So mm -hmm. you get the pleasure. You get the feeling yeah. that you've Sharing done something. Sharing joy with everybody. It's Maybe beautiful. you'll be able to stay in this country, Shia, if you uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay, Shia, make the you right wish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, that's it. so for those now, I didn't want to keep this too local because, of course, there's people listening all over. But, but for Toronto, mm -hmm. on June 21st, mm -hmm. where do people go if they want to be part of this? Okay, they can send a message to you. Oh. Uh, or they can send me a message. <laughs> not me personally, <laughs> please. <laughs> not you, but yeah. your Sure, to Rock Media, yeah. But uh, for sure. Do you sure, have a website? or Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jim Berim, G-Y-M-B-E-R-I-M dot com or Fariba Fat Therapy uh, um, on Instagram. Uh, if you want to participate, for sure, I welcome everyone. And this uh, is, in, you're, you're in North York, right? Uh, for people who Young are in the Shepherd. GTA who are listening. Yeah. All right, all right. Well, the, well, the Asha orders you. I love the idea. Mm -hmm. I think you should. I hope that you continue to do it, and I hope it becomes an international sensation. It's such a, a lovely. It reminds me of something like, um, like Noruz, for example. Mm -hmm. It's it's yeah. it 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 seems that it it really only has pure and lovely intentions mm -hmm. uh, behind it. Right. Yeah, and um, not that I have anything against religion. I I, I respect people who have religious ideas but this is separate that's why i want to keep it separate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this is not i'm so glad that he brought up the question that what is the difference mm -hmm. it's totally different so it's not like people are going to come with daste and ashro taswa and <laughs> like vanjir right. it's mm -hmm. nothing like that it's right. different right. shai actually wanted to attend <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> maybe. Shai, was, shai wants to know where you can get the ashra <laughs> nasri yeah maybe yeah. we can <laughs> set another date for ashra nasri but this is yeah. totally but, no separate. no we got that we got that idea <laughs> thank you thank you so much for coming in Fanny thank John. So it's been a uh, and me. for explaining the tradition of this and and the idea and we will put a link for, of your whatever uh, is the best link um, uh, if you're listening to this look in the description of the show and we'll mm -hmm. you'll find the link there for uh, to contact Fariba for Asha Auto Zoo and it sounds like uh, you're ready to get a lot of um, you're gonna get a lot of uh, people contacting you thank so thank you so much it would be my honor and for all the people who are not here in this studio right now um, all I can say is that good people are sitting here they're yeah. just too good looking that um <laughs> i feel bad that people um don't get to see don't you see right us. now yeah. i know she's too kind did you, you say her no, something no, no, honestly no. you're so beautiful oh, you're so and kind. he's so good looking and thank you Aww. thank you it's uh we, we, wait we, your reza is not in the studio right now i should just i, I, checked I should him clarify out, here she's talking about how everybody's good looking except reza today's not my day bro well you're very sweet thank, thank you. you thank you so much you. And, and what a pleasure Amazing. thank you again Fariba Fard, uh, the Asha Arazu uh, program uh, pro project June 21st we'll talk about it again on this show uh, in the lead up to it and give you more details but hey wherever you are in the Persian diaspora somewhere around the world this is a good chance for you to get involved in this project I think it's a it's a beautiful beautiful idea it's Monday it's time for letters of the week Is anybody, else, is anybody else hungry now? I am All this talk of yeah. Osh. I just had I know, a headache right? <laughs> from Reza. Oh, <laughs> we should get Osh from across the street. Yeah. There's an Osh, Osh place. What is yeah, that? An there's an Osh place. place. All right, guys, letters. How about that? <laughs> so, Jean, what up? <laughs> so, uh, all right, so we have a letter from Reza Ayin wrote saying, I'm honored to have won the letter of the week. Oh, I was watching. That was last week. He won yeah. the letter. Uh, he says, "I was watching this episode with my family, and my kids were saying, Dad, they're yelling your name.' <laughs> my th my three and five year old children like watching the show. Keep it up, guys. Merci, Gian. That's so that. cute. Congratulations, Reza. I love the way he t he calls it uh, winning the letter of the week. <laughs> <laughs> the, really, the com the competition. That yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's like whatever key, whichever email Keon sees last <laughs> yeah, yeah. is the winner. I mean, it's last it's like I won the letter of the week. <laughs> it was yeah. a good letter. But no, it, it was a good yeah. letter. Let's give a couple of compliments. Mm -hmm. That's it. <laughs> 
All right, so last Thursday we had an episode uh, with Dr. Surush Dabor on the show, uh, and the title of the show was Are Iranians Lousy at Dialogue? Oof. Poor, so, a conversation about poor conversations yes. skills in our community. AKA talking to Reza. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people wrote about that. Uh, we have Afiru saying, Iranian c- communication has many layers and many forms of expression and could be more advanced than the modern Western communication. If we had the right theoretical education and knowledge behind it, who can blame us for it since 1979? Have you seen the current school curriculum? Debating makes no sense where critical thinking gets punished and taboos are made instead of questioned. One of the achievements that Shaw was trying to make was to make people understand that there are different points of view by supporting the national radio and TV to produce movies about alternative lifestyles and their acceptance, but he was cut short. This was teaching democracy on a very basic level. Zarathustra taught the importance of good thoughts, good words, and good deeds, which assumes that it is good versus evil. So you are either good or bad, friend or enemy, rich or poor. This is what Americans and Iranians have in common. No nuance point of view in life. Hmm. Hmm. Great letter. Thank you for that, Fidus. And you know that point that when we were talking about Dr. Dabal about uh, the lack of critical thinking, Mm -hmm. you've made that point, uh, Chaya, before about, and actually so has, I mean, Super P and Anahita and others on our team about schooling in Iran, Mm -hmm. contemporary Iran, where critical thinking is not only not taught, but is poo-pooed. It's dismissed. It's they don't encourage it at all. I mean, it's like the the, the same things that you would get a good mark for here. Oh, good, good for you. Critical thinking. You get a bad mark. You know, you're not falling in line. It's bad, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No freedom of expression or thinking. On that, and that, I mean, Dr. Dabach saying, well, that that's going to be one of the seeds of of lack of. Uh, healthy dialogue and communication yeah, yeah, is yeah. that and it's if you're if you're not a critical thinker, you only you 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 lose your ability or exactly. you have less ability to, to see shades of gray. You exactly. only see black and white, and if you only see black and white, then you you only see right and wrong, and you think and you're right, and so you're not going to listen to somebody else. That's it. And the world is not like that. It's just not right and wrong. Things yeah. are more fluid and relative than than you think. And I should say that there were some. Well, let's keep going. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Hope. And then Honey Aryan wrote saying, such a good discussion, so relatable, honestly. Yes, Iranians, we are not the greatest at communicating, and we are never wrong. Hmm. I hope we can train ourselves and teach our children better. Agreed. Thank you for that. And then Pars Lorestanian wrote saying, Mr. Dabor, your dad's generation created a discourse that brought hell and blood upon the whole society, and then you expect us to accept that Islamist approach as a point of view? So no, the most tolerant we can be is to ask for proof of your discourse. Hmm. Yeah, there were some folks who are not, I mean, there was fans of Suresh Dabal who uh, were really excited about this episode, and then there were some fan, folks who were less than enthusiastic about um, yeah. uh, him, and I guess also about his dad, yes. who's sort of a controversial figure. Yeah. But um, in, in a way, some of the, I mean, I am never, ever, you're never going to catch me complaining about someone who listens to the program yeah. and has an issue with it. Yeah. You know, you listen to the program and tell us why you don't like it, something That's that was said that you didn't yeah. like, something. But if you don't listen to it yeah. and you just go, I can't believe you guys had this person on, uh, you know, and, and it's they were kind of some of the, the critical uh, feedback we received was making the point of the episode. <laughs> exactly. It was It was yeah. like... Okay, so there's no dialogue here. You've just saw, seen that we're bringing a guest on that you don't agree with, and so you're you're shouting that this is a terrible episode. In fact, the episode was did have nuance, and and I mean, you yeah. know, uh, it was it was it was it was an interesting discourse that should invite further discourse. That by its very nature won't be you guys just agreeing with us. Yeah, you know, tell us why you disagree, but. 
give it give it a chance i would say it's like seeing a headline on social media and just taking any assumption that you feel like is right and be like yeah this is it like new That's york the times the hell with it it was just kind of a funny it was sort of ironic yeah. that the very thing that we're talking about mm-hmm. is what got practiced in the feedback and yeah, the, yeah. the response to in some cases it, the very it was a it was a minority uh, but but some of the fe- the response to the episode was how dare you bring this yeah, person yeah. on yeah. why are you having this conversation yeah. instead of and the and the, and the, the episode is about lack of conversation yeah. and r- rushing to judgment right yeah. so, don't judge yeah. a podcast by its thumbnail cover guys <laughs> yeah. on that note it's time for letter of the week yeah. oh Club. this week's letter of the week goes to uh, username I like I oh. you know okay. like me I um, so he or she wrote a very um, well written letter let's okay. let's put it that way and so that's why they got letter of the week oh, yeah. there it, it works that way you know that's why they won, uh, won the <laughs> that letter indeed yeah. indeed um, so he or she wrote saying the circumstances surrounding the calling off of Iran versus Canada match could teach us some valuable lessons when it comes to how we communicate amongst ourselves and even outside the all things Iranian community in this case first We got people who love their country, love the team Meli, love the players, and are proud that they have made it to the World Cup. But then they slam the brakes so hard and go, wait a minute, hold that thought. Let's start all over. All of a sudden, we are dealing with a situation that has gotten completely out of hand. This does not make sense to me at all, and I'm saying this while I deeply sympathize with them in this tragic event. Why would people still, and to this date, associate events related to the national soccer team with the national policies of the government? Why would anyone lose sleep and get depressed over a game and let their emotions run the show? Did the players have anything to do with that event? They want to see their team advance to the higher stages. They need to understand the team needs playtime and lots of it. Otherwise, there's no point supporting their heroes, in quotations, their. Uh, This brings me to this. To become effective communicators, we need to start to make practical steps and change the way we see things. That goes for most of us. Getting emotional over everything and always complaining and finding something to gripe about has gotten too old, in my opinion. Time to be straight up with each other. No hiding the truth. No fabricating things. Kind of like Captain Reza treats Gion, Kion, and Shia. Hmm. Hmm. Sort I'm of gla- a compliment to no, you. No, but actually, I'm glad she brought that up, and I'm glad that you gave her the litter of the week. Or he. he. Or he. I think uh, it's a he, yes. actually. Us, I person, mm-hmm. because uh, respectfully and with all the love in my heart that I truly have for this person, because his uh, eye is a very uh, thoughtful and uh, th- um, smart individual, I would say I disagree mm-hmm. with this particular. C- I agree with every point that was made. Mm-hmm. And on the grand scheme of things, is completely right. But you agree? You think that the game the, should have the been canceled? The game should have been canceled. In this particular case, because this is a very secluded and indiv- individual event, and the reason is because like nobody's saying Iran shouldn't go to Jama Jahani, like the World mm-hmm. Cup. Iran is there, and everybody's cheering for it. Yeah. But and because that is uh, that is what's gonna if you're worried about the players of the team that mm-hmm. whose future are kind of dependent on them shining on mm-hmm. on the bigger field. Jama Jahani is the place for it, not Canada. That's it's who's the, which the, we were going to the, to, to, to the World Cup for the first time ourselves. Mm-hmm. So it's not like it's not like these players are going to get the best game of their life or training. Again, it's very delicate as as the I mentioned, and it's a fine line. Sorry, you as be you mentioned or the letter writer? The letter <laughs> as I the letter writer. I know this is confusing. <laughs> now. It's like uh, anybody listening to this part of the show, like Rez has got some psychological <laughs> issues. As I mentioned, <laughs> I, disagree I, I. I disagree with I. I disagree with I. I'm sorry. Who do you disagree with? He's a crazy person. Hi. <laughs> so yourself? No, no, no. I. I disagree with I. <laughs> <laughs> right, but right, right. in all seriousness, I, John, uh, I agree with a lot of the points that you made in this particular case. I would have agreed with you, but I think we can make an exception here. So, yeah. Well, I, I don't think that this letter writer uh, would disagree with you disagree. Yeah. You oh, know, I mean, that, I mean, if that's, if that's the, if the, uh, if the upshot is let's communicate, let's talk to each other, then presumably we're allowed to have different points of view i would yeah. think and um 
And please, Ijan, tell us what your real name is. <laughs> but thanks for making this the letter of the week, <laughs> Kia. Now That's you're going to get us on all kinds of trouble. I love it. <laughs> it's my favorite kind of letter. <laughs> why, so it's, it's a whole. Why do you like this Civil letter? Civil War, Kia. Uh, it was just well written, and it brought up a point of view that I guess hasn't been heard. Um, you know. Amongst the community, there's a lot of outrage over this game being um, played. So he, he's pointing out that, you know, it's okay to have a different view of things. Mm -hmm. So um, I, to be honest, I didn't really think of it. Uh, I was just like, yeah, a soccer match, whatever. But then once I started seeing like, um, what's his name, Hamid, who lost his wife and child to that flight downing mm -hmm. at the hands of the Iranian mm -hmm. government, when I saw him, you know, speaking out and like just the outrage that you know they're bringing mm -hmm. a match against a like a government that literally killed yeah. his loved ones that made me think of it differently so yeah, I, I there's no right answer i guess but the, it made me th like agree with them canceling the game mm -hmm. let's put it that way All right. yeah uh okay well there you go thank you for the letter of the week thank you for all of the um all the letters keep them coming and you can write us directly at info at rookmedia.com or post on any of our our platforms wherever you're listening to or watching us thank you uh this has been quite a show a yeah. lot of diverse uh, diversity from the violin to the uh <laughs> global marketplace to the oh, ashe <laughs> Arezu. Arezu to uh match yeah. your own match game. to your own match yeah thank you captain reza thank groovy you, shia the fabulous keon this is full time for rook for today remember for all of the information about this program this network all of our different programs all of our guests, etc. go to rookmedia.com, rookmedia.com, R-O-Q-E, media.com, where you can also support us by pressing the support us button, strangely enough. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together each week, Savvy Roham, Talented Anahita, Ponta the Artist, The Fabulous Keon, Super Parisa, Smart Pega, Ahai Merthad, Captain Reza, and Groovy Shaya. Thank you to all of you out there for supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe on any of our platforms or all of them if you've not done so already. You can find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. Give us a good rating on Apple Podcasts. And in the meantime, Mizunbashi. <laughs>